Superior Court of the State of California, County of Monterey, and Department of Senate is now in session. Honorable Judge Halsey presiding. Please be seated and come to order. Please turn off all cell phones and refrain from talking. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the final round of the 2024 mock trial. We are here in the case of the people of the state of California versus Toby Clark. And uh, at this time, would the uh, people like to present their legal team? I know that we have two very well-regarded and well-known legal teams representing their various sides today. And I believe from the prosecution, we have the Carmel legal team. And you can go ahead and introduce yourselves. Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Shayla Dutta, and along with my co-counsel, Grant Shu. Good afternoon, Your Honor. And Julius Dutta. Good afternoon, Your Honor. We represent the people in today's case. Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Daniela Foley, and I'm Jerry Moyet. Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Scarlett Wenerholm, and I am Detective Nova Perrin. Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Brianna Suto, and I'm Dr. Casey Vasquez. Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Julia Jackson, and I'm Amari Sunshine. We are also joined by our courtroom clerk. Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Dylan Chor, and I'll be serving as the courtroom clerk for today's trial. I will be providing visual and verbal warnings for two minutes, one minute, 30 seconds, and stop. And finally, our coaches, Mr. Schreier. Good afternoon, Your Honor. And Ms. Morgan. Good afternoon, Your Honor. That concludes introductions from the people. Thank you very much. And with the defense uh, team, the team of the Stevenson Law Firm, like to introduce themselves at this time. Hello, Your Honor. My name is Maya Chavez, and I will be the defense pre-trial attorney for today's case. May the trial attorneys please introduce themselves? Please. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Sophie Sperano, and I will be a defense attorney in today's case. Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Michael Blitch, and I'll be a defense attorney in today's case. Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Ryan Hubanks, and I will be a defense attorney in tonight's case. May the witnesses please introduce themselves. Yes. Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Alyssa Sun, and I will be playing Arian Sunshine in today's case. Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Nora Wilcox, and I will be playing the role of Dr. Parker Turner in today's case. Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Martin Wong, and I will be playing Toby Clark in today's case. Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Maya Tse, and I will be playing Nick Yang. Or Bailiff, please introduce yourself. Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is William Gutierrez, and I will be the bailiff in today's case. May the coaches please introduce themselves. Yes. Good afternoon, Your Honor. John Hubank, I'm one of the attorney coaches. Good afternoon, Your Honor. It's Susan Fletch. I'm one of the attorney coaches. Thank you so much. And uh, everybody now, uh, having introduced themselves, the court has received the uh, motions, uh, well, the motion and the response to the defense motion to suppress evidence uh, that was derived from the geofence warrant. And at this time, uh, since it is the defense motion, would the defense like to proceed with summarizing your arguments? Yes, Your Honor, may I proceed? You may. Maya Chavez for the defense. The defense moves to exclude all data collected from the geofence from evidence on the grounds that the warrant used was insufficiently particular and Detective Perrin had far too much ex discretion in its execution. The prosecution attorney will try to convince you that Detective Perrin had probable cause to retrieve the cell phone evidence of 80 individuals, but this is completely incorrect, especially when we delve into the sloppy and careless aspects of Detective Perrin's work. Detective Perrin's initial warrant for geofence was where he made his first mistake. Detective Perrin crafted a warrant that consisted almost the entire hotel, including all 10 floors, and included area outside of the hotel. Well, um, counsel, I, I think that it was perhaps intended to be a circumference, a radius of uh, 75 feet because it is a vertical hotel uh, that in this type of technology is going to necessitate some um, additional uh, information coming from the other floors. But in that, it was limited in terms of scope uh, regarding time, because it was only for one uh, minute, essentially, 11 o'clock, as well as the 75-foot uh, diameter, rather than the 194-foot diameter that it was in the Shaytree case, uh, 
wouldn't you say that given the cases that we have before us, it, the first part of the warrant fell well within what is permitted? Well, Your Honor, I do not believe that the warrant was limited in scope or time, given the fact that it encompassed area that was clearly unrelated to the crime and had zero probable cause of being related to the crime. I believe the streets that it bled on to, um, I believe it was Great Avenue and Fifth Street, did not have probable cause. All the people walking down the streets, side street had zero probability of being associated with the crime, Your Honor. Um, additionally, I think Detective Perrin, given his years of expertise, could have crafted the geofence to only encompass Kieran's room or the hallway surrounding. I'm not so sure about that, um, just given some of the information that was provided. Um, apparently, Detective Perrin, from his experience, ascertained that um, there is some uh, margin of error in the technology, and that's why the detective chose to have the 75-foot diameter, which, again, is quite a bit uh, smaller than in other warrants that have been deemed to be um, within the parameters of the Fourth Amendment. So um, can you point to any specific authority in your brief that supports your position? Well, Your Honor, I think that um, although the size of the geofence you said may be smaller than other cases, it did sweep up the information of a lot more individuals. In the U.S. versus Chartier case, as you stated, they only collected 19 cell phones, whereas ours collected 80, 20 of which came from outside of the hotel. And while the size of the geofences may differ slightly, I think um, ours is still overbroad in time and in scope. So you are focusing on the result, in other words, the amount of information rather than on the scope that was defined in the warrant. I'm not sure that that is something that courts have focused on, in other words, in a, an area that has a much greater concentration of people, such as a hotel. Uh, wouldn't it be reasonable to expect that you were going to have a greater amount of information that is produced, uh, even if you were trying to limit the scope? Sorry, Your Honor, I meant to say, or not necessarily, I think detective parents still could have crafted the geofence to only include area inside of the hotel, and um, I know that a geofence can be shaped in any shape or form, not just circular, therefore detective parent could have cut it off, so not necessarily does it only pertain to the amount of cell phones swept up, but also just the size. I don't think the streets outside of the hotel needed to be included in the geofence, nor did um, the opposite end of the hotel that wasn't as close to um, the victim's room. And I think the number of cell phones that swept up isn't necessarily just the outcome, but it also does have to do with the fact that a geofence should be limited by the probable, probable cause in which it is based. And I think that Detective Perrin didn't do a good job of really ensuring that he kept the individuals that were involved with the crime um, outside of the investigation. Well, Detective Perrin indicated again in the affidavit and in uh, testimony that the reason for the 75-foot diameter was to incorporate the room where the crime occurred as well as the hallway uh, adjacent to that room where any suspects would have had to have been present. Isn't that very similar to the case of uh, People versus Price where the warrant um, circumference or the radius was concentrated on where the crime occurred, which was the front porch of the decedent's home, as well as the area uh, directly in front of the decedent's residence and two houses on either side to incorporate folks who may have come to the home. Yes, Your Honor, I think that Price versus Beer Court is distinguishable from this case as their time period is only 22 minutes, whereas ours was expanded to five. Additionally, their um, geofence only encompassed five cell phones, whereas ours encompassed 80. Um, and well, I think that you're mixing a bit of apples and oranges. So the first aspect of the warrant, stage one, so to speak, here, did result in the uh, numbers of uh, 80 different individuals being produced. Uh, however, at that point, uh, it was not uh, 22 minutes as it was in the Price case. It wasn't four hours as it was expanded to. The four hours um, expansion only came uh, once the 80 uh, phones were reduced to five. So it was only five individuals um, information 
that was uh, sought in phase two. Yes, Sharon, I do think price is still distinguishable here, um, given the fact that still they had, um, they started the time period right when in price the shooting started, whereas Detective Karen here started the time of the geofence at 11, even though the victim was alive and talking in the room at the time of 11.10. And I think this is a prime example of Detective Perrin having too much discretion in creating the geofence and not using his knowledge to make it sufficiently particular and tailored to the crime at hand. So are you um, suggesting that Detective Perrin should have actually had a greater time frame to perhaps have uh, more accurate information? I don't think a greater time frame, rather perhaps start the time frame at 11.10 when they knew um, the victim was still alive at the time of 11.10 instead of start it at 11 when, you, when we know for that 10 minutes from 11 to 11.10 that the victim was still alive and well. You may go ahead and proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Detective Perrin's initial warrant was where he made his first mistake. Um, Detective Perrin, sorry. Parents swept up the information of 80 cell phones, 20 of which were from outside of the hotel. This gathering of innocent data of innocent individuals could have easily been prevented if Detective Perrin used more care in his work. Let me just ask you about that because um, with regard to folks who are out on the street, is there really an expectation of privacy when we do have uh, surveillance cameras essentially everywhere? So uh, much greater information than an unidentified cell phone number is being um, ascertained when somebody is out on the street. So um, it would seem as if that is uh, minimal, if any, infringement on the privacy rights. Well, Your Honor, I do believe that location data is still very personal information, and just by walking past the outside of the hotel or going in and out of your own room on, say, a vacation does not give someone else the right to have your location information, and not just that, but I believe that the first round of the geofence also included calls they were receiving, and I do not think that the people, um, innocent people just walking by, clearly unrelated to the crime, had given up their right to um, be included in this investigation. And you do keep referring to people, but actually it was... Um you have pointed out that there was some additional information that the detective requested, however, it was still anonymized. So there were no people who were attached to these devices. And would you agree that devices do not have uh, a Fourth Amendment uh, right to privacy? Well, Your Honor, while the devices might not, we all know that people carry on their cell phones like it's themselves, and I think that even though the device is um, different, it's an extension of the person and still carries a lot of personal information that lies with someone and is able to tell you a lot about someone or their whereabouts or what is going on and who, are they who they are talking to, and therefore I think it is still pretty personal information that should not be let out. And can you point to um, one of the cases, perhaps, that talks about, um, at this stage, that you're talking about stage one, where we have completely anonymized data, where um, it, it was found to be uh, overbroad to the extent that the warrant was uh, suppressed or the information was suppressed? Well, Your Honor, I think U.S. versus Lofsted does a good job of showing this. Lofsted states that the scope of a warrant, um, because it was too broad and encompassed too many individuals, was not allowed, and the good faith exception was not allowed. And I think the same can be said for our case. Um, the scope of the warrant was too big and it was too overbroad and contained too many individuals to be um, allowed. But wasn't the Lofsted case a case that involved one phone, one individual, and the fatality of that particular warrant was that it did not have any time limitation whatsoever, but rather, I think in the words of the court, it allowed the officers to go rummaging through uh, and obtain all of the content of this individual's phone without any limitation um, that would be consistent with perhaps the time that the alleged crimes were to have occurred. So isn't that a significant difference than from here where we do have that time limitation? Yes, Your Honor. While I do think the circumstances of Lofsted are slightly different, I think um, the message from the court in Lofsted does still pertain. Um, they specifically mentioned breath, which is states, again, that the scope of the warrant must be limited on which the probable cause on which it is based. And I do not think that Detective Perrin did the best of their ability to really focus the geofence on um, the probable cause on which it is based. All right, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. 
Um, despite knowing that Kieran was also alive at the time of 11.10, Detective Perrin made the time period start at 11 p.m. This is a prime example that Detective Perrin had far too much discretion in, broaden in broadening the fence to gather unnecessary information. Well, wait a minute. You, you, um, I just want to make sure that I understand your argument correctly because you said that the detective um, selected the time of 11 p.m., which is correct uh, for any number of reasons. Um, but at that point, a magistrate was approving the warrant, so um, it would not appear that the uh, approval of that phase was necessarily uh, a result of any particular discretion on, or unchecked discretion on the part of the officer. Would you agree that there was oversight at that juncture? Yes, Your Honor, there was oversight, but I think um, Detective Perrin still made a mistake in creating the geofence start at 11 p.m. when we knew the victim was alive at the time of 11.10. I think if Detective Perrin wanted to make the geofence really sufficiently particular and only encompass information that was vital to the crime, they could have started the time period at 11.10 p.m. All right, you may go ahead and proceed. Your Honor. Um, then, without an additional warrant or judicial oversight, Detective Perrin narrowed the list from 80 cell phones to five, requested location information from these phones, and expanded the window to four hours. Information of innocent people, sorry, as in the case Grove versus Ramirez, the warrant in our case is completely invalid. The court said that the warrant was invalid as it did not describe the content of the search with sufficient particularity. Well, in that case, it did not state what the, what the um subject matter was at all, correct? That was the case that involved a search of a home and um, the officers were looking for firearms and other types of weapons and did not even state in the warrant that that's what they were looking for, whereas here um, it's very clear that the officer is wanting from Google the information um, regarding the devices that were in a particular place in a, at a particular time. So isn't that much different than the Grow case? Yes, Your Honor. Well, I think the Grow case is slightly different in um, not revealing what the content of the search was. I do think it does a good job of showing that, s despite that, dis Detective Perrin still did not act in good faith by creating a geofence that was narrowly tailored to only include um, cell phones that were pertinent to the crime at hand. But you, you did acknowledge that uh, the detective did reduce from 80 to 5 um, the information that he was seeking in the second phase. Yes, Your Honor. He did narrow it from 80 to 5, but he did not do this without a second warrant, which I do believe could have um, been a prime example of him executing good faith, but in, in not going back to the warrant and ensuring the safety of these um, 80 to 5 individuals, I think that that is a prime example that Detective Perrin did not do the best they could to prevent um, this misuse of discretion. But don't we have another case that was cited in the points and authorities? That's the people of uh, the people versus Mesa, and that occurred very close in time to this particular case, as you know. And in that case as well, the officer did not um, request a second warrant. As a matter of fact, uh, the officer in the 2022 case of Chapey also did not request a second warrant. I'm not sure that there was a, a, a case that was cited that used um, that technique of getting a second warrant. But in any event, uh, the courts in both of those cases did not find that uh, there was any bad faith. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. While both those cases, people who made and U.S. Fisher Charchi both stated that getting a second warrant or obtaining a second warrant was not necessary, they both suggested that it was would be very helpful in ensuring the safety of these individuals. And I believe that um, given these cases before, they set a standard for what good faith looks like. And the three months prior, and then the other case in 2022, U.S. versus Chartree, gave Detective Perrin ample opportunity to study these cases and learn what good faith looks like and use this in his new execution during this case. But I do not think he lived up to the standard set in both of those of what good faith looks like. Didn't the court in Mesa also say that we, we still are in a very new area here, and despite the a court in uh, Chaitri, uh, or Chaitri having suggested in 2022 that a second warrant be um, sought in 2023, April of 2023, with the Mesa case, uh, the court did not say, hey, 
you, you should have known back in 2022, and now you can't say you didn't know any better, they still felt that the officers were acting within the parameters of good faith. Yes, Your Honor, while those two cases still allowed the officers to continue to practice with the exception of good faith, I think that given the U.S. versus Charger case and the people who made the case, Detective Perrin should know by now what good faith looks like. I think U.S. versus Charger set a standard, said strike number one, it's okay, let this officer go off. People who made it was strike number two and let the officer go off, Your Honor. I think this is the time, strike number three, where Detective Perrin needs to be held accountable for his actions and his bad faith that was executed with the geofence should be punished in this trial. Well, um, I don't know that there is any uh, aspect of the Fourth Amendment jurisprudence that talks about punishment. Um, what is discussed is the importance of deterrence of bad faith behavior, but there also is an element of not being a right of a defendant uh, to have uh, information suppressed uh, when, there, when there is good faith or when there is not bad faith. So uh, can you speak to that or cite uh, an authority that you feel s supports your position that as to this case, um, there was bad faith or desire to have an unfair advantage, as was discussed in the Leon case. Well, Your Honor, while I think um, Detective Perrin has five past experiences using geofence, Detective Perrin knows what he's doing executing these warrants. And I think given that Detective Perrin has a standard to live up to that was set in the People v. Mesa and the U.S. versus Charge Street case, and I think that not going back for a second warrant was a prime example of this far too much discretion and initially setting the time period um, at 11 p.m. instead of 11.10 was an example of this misuse of discretion as well as just in general creating the geofence to be overbroad was Detective Perry not really committing to act in good faith in the execution of the due offense. And you did mention that um, Detective Perrin does have some experience having previously uh, sought and received five uh, warrants, geofence warrants. So doesn't that undercut your argument that he should have sought a second search warrant because he didn't do so previously and those warrants were all approved by a magistrate and apparently uh, were not challenged, uh, at least as far as we know. Well, Your Honor, I do not know um, exactly what his past geofences look like. I do think that Detective Parent shouldn't be held accountable to the standards of his past geofences, but rather the standards set by these cases we have in front of us, um, such as people who may send U.S. versus charge tree. And I think that, again, as I said, he did not um, do all that he could to prevent the sweeping up of innocent data or creating a geofence that was only based on the probable cause around the crime. And so uh, you feel that this is the case even though the court in Mesa stated or noted that um, the officers were working with scant judicial precedent and a brand new investigative tool and therefore fell within the good faith exception to the warrant requirement. And that was just three months before this case. So would, wouldn't that suggest that uh, good faith would apply to this situation, even if, the, for the sake of argument, the court agrees that the warrant was overbroad? Well, Your Honor, I think, again, given his past experience with geofences, this isn't necessarily a novel technology to Detective Barron. He's had pa five past uses with it, and he knows what he's doing. Additionally, geofence warrants um, started to occur a few years ago, and I think we need to start setting a standard for the good faith exception isn't going to continue on forever, and I think this can be a case in which we note that um, the good faith exception can't continue be to, to be used as this technology becomes more and more incorporated into um, police use. All right, may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, the warrant in our case was overbroad. Detective Perrin did not get the approval of a second warrant to gather the location information or to expand the time period of the geofence. Therefore, the warrant is invalid. The court in Grove versus Ramirez also discusses an officer's duty to act in good faith. But Detective Perrin did not do all that he could to craft the geofence to be sufficiently particular and instead created a geofence that entrapped the information of innocent people. The geofence information should be excluded. And, and um, just let me ask you about this point. You keep talking about these other people. Um, there were five people whose information somewhat uh, additional information was sought for the expanded time period. 
the other 75 people's information as to one photograph in time, so to speak, at 11 o'clock, that uh, was anonymized, continued to be anonymized, and therefore, um, most likely, nobody even knew that their information had been a part of this particular search. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor, but I do believe that these 78 uninvolved individuals still should not be included in Detective Perrin's search, especially considering the five individuals that he did de-anonymize, three of which were clearly unrelated to the crime. I think Detective Perrin could have gone a step further in narrowing his search before de-anonymizing the information of three people who were simply staying at the Bells Hotel, enjoying their stay, um, who had nothing to do with the crime and had all of their information exposed. And so let's go back to the Leon rule for a moment, because one of the quotes from the Leon case was where the police act in good faith and based on it and good faith based on an invalidated search warrant, the cost of applying the exclusionary rule may be allowing some guilty defendants to go free and generating disrespect for the law. So doesn't that suggest that we have to have a balance? because we don't want people to uh, feel that um, if, if an officer doesn't do exactly what maybe a court would have asked them to do, looking back with 2020 hindsight, when they're in the throes of an investigation, that everybody's gonna walk free. Well, Your Honor, yes, I do believe there needs to be balance, but as I stated, Detective Perrin has been working for 10 years. They've executed five past year offenses, and I think that Detective Perrin despite the stress of this case and this investigation, still needed to act um, in the best way to ensure that their geofence was sufficiently particular and to protect the information of these 78 uninvolved individuals. And I do not think that Detective Perrin did the absolute best they could to prevent this um, exposure of their information. Per se. And how is this any different than, say, going back to the Chaitry case, uh, where the officers did use the exact same process so there were uh, individuals whose information may have been uh, taken. However, what we're focused on here really is information involving your client. And certainly there was probable cause for, uh, to uh, obtain all of the evidence vis-a-vis -vis your client's cell phone, correct? Well, yes, Your Honor, but I'm not just concerned about Mr. Toby Clark. I'm also concerned about the people walking around the hotel that Detective Perrin had no right to incorporate their information into this investigation. I think, in general, the warrant needs to be particularized to the crime, and I do not think that Detective Perrin did that exactly. So when you talk about all these people walking around the hotel, most of them are in public areas, correct, in hallways, with the exception of those who may have been in hotel rooms? Yes, Your Honor. All right, and I believe that... Um, Again, outside of the 75 uh, who immediately uh, were taken out of the equation, there were only three people who were not involved, who were on the same floor of the hotel, the 10th floor, um, who again were ruled out once it was ascertained that they were staying in uh, different rooms unrelated to this offense. Yes, sir. And so those are the people that you're concerned about? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. And you may proceed. Thank you. Um, okay. Additionally, the geofence information should be excluded due to Detective Perrin's lack of good faith. Two minutes. Additionally, in U.S. v. Lofstead, the court stated that general warrants are unconstitutional. As in our case, Detective Perrin's warrant was insufficiently specific given the large overbroad fence. The court in Lofstead specifically mentions the importance of breadth, which requires the scope of warrant to be limited by the probable cause on which the warrant is based. Considering breadth alone, the warrant should be revoked as it included passerbys outside of the hotel, people who have zero probable cause of being associated with the crime whatsoever. The court in People v. Mesa, a state case decided three months before ours, determined that although an officer's warrant was sufficiently particular, they had too much discretion in carrying it out. The court in People v. Mesa, said that the geofence is too broad to be supported by probable cause given the amount of people it pinged within the fence. The court was concerned about the potential sweeping up of the location data of uninvolved individuals. But, counsel, as you indicated, I believe that that was primarily at the second stage where the, where the search was expanded and uh, in the Mesa case as well, the uh, court did find that the officers were acting in good faith. So you go back to that there may not have been probable cause for 
every one of the 75 people to be uh, considered as a suspect in the crime, but um, the court is not that certain that that is the standard that is set forth in these cases. Rather, it is probable cause to believe that the information necessary to the investigation will be found within the scope of that um, of search that the warrant is requesting. Yes, Your Honor. Um, I do believe, though, that people v. Mesa still states this as they are concerned about but the potential sweeping up of the location data of uninvolved individuals. And this case was three months before our case, which gave Detective Perrin ample time to study this and really ensured that they would not sweep up the location data or de-anonymize the information of uninvolved personnel, yet they still did this in creating um, or gathering the information of these three uninvolved people who were simply going in and out of their own hotel room and had nothing to do with the crime. And although people who Mesa doesn't necessarily um, rule on this in, as they use the good faith exception, I think they do set a standard for what good faith looks like and encourage that the good faith exception, as in Chartree says, be used less and less. And I think this case should be a prime example of the good faith exception not continuing to be used. Going back to Leon, um, the point was made in that case that even where officers could have done a better job uh, and even where uh, minor uh, errors had been made, that was not going to um, mean that the warrant would not be valid. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Um, that is what is stated in U.S. versus Leon, but I do not believe that these are minor mistakes created by Detective Perrin. As we stated, he has much experience with these warrants, and I think that gives him an even um, greater understanding of how geofences work and a greater understanding of how to make them sufficiently particular. Um, and this wasn't a minor mistake of encompassing streets outside of the hotel when he could have simply taken the time to create a geofence and snip off the edges of the geofence that encompass the street. Instead, he picked a circle that was big enough and went with it instead of taking time to carefully craft a geofence that only encompassed information pertinent to the crime. Well, isn't it true that um, it's unlikely that any geofence would have been able to do that, um, in part because um, th whatever area was drawn was going to encompass some public hallways. That was what it was intended to do, those uh, hallways adjacent to the uh, place where the murder occurred. So um, isn't it true that potentially there was going to be some information that was provided, anonymized information, that was not going to be relevant to the investigation? Yes, Your Honor. I think with any Jew offense, it is said that there is going to be some information, but I think in all of these cases, they state that an officer needs to do the best job to ensure that this number is minimized, that instead of 80 people that's getting de-anonymized, we cut that down by 20, which Detective Perrin could have done if he simply um, didn't include the area outside of the hotel, or as you stated, a geofence can be shaped in any shape or form, so simply include Kieran's room and the hallway surrounding instead of um, including, in like, um, areas of the hotel that were not um, directly related to the crime. But you would agree that there has been no court that has um, found or suppressed um, evidence and granted a motion such as this one um, based upon facts that are similar to the case here. Um, while there might not necessarily be facts as um, pertinent to ours, I do believe, as I said, U.S. versus, US versus Law said does a good job of opening up the idea that a the scope of a warrant should be um, limited enough and that if a scope of the warrant is too big that the good faith exception should not apply. And while the circumstances of that case are different, I do think that the message from that case should still stand in ours today. Thank you. Thank you. May I proceed? Absolutely. Thank you. There is no question that in our case, Detective Perrin swept up the location data of at least 78 uninvolved individuals. People v. Mesa does an incredible job of displaying the amount of freedom given to Detective Perrin and his misuse of this discretion. Your Honor, we must consider all aspects of Detective Perrin's work and the circumstances of the warrant. The warrant obtained was overbroad, insufficiently particular, executed not in good faith, and at the expense of uninvolved personnel. The information of the geofence was collected at the hands of Detective Perrin's perfunctory work. Therefore, all evidence from the geofence must not be admitted into evidence today. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. And would you like to present the summary of your argument, Counsel? Before I proceed, may I have a moment to set up an enlargement of Exhibit A? Please.
You may proceed. Julius Dutta, for the people. May it please the court. During a homicide investigation, police obtained a geofence warrant seeking all cell phones within a 75 foot radius of the murder scene at the time of the murder. Because it is a fact of modern life that people carry cell phones, this warrant was based on adequate probable cause and was particularized to meet the requirements of the Fourth Amendment. We ask that the defendant's motion to quash be denied. On July 17, 2023, the body of Kieran Sunshine was found in his suite at the Bells Hotel. Mr. Sunshine had been stabbed to death with a champagne saber, and the estimated time of death was 11 p.m. Based on this information, Detective Perrin obtained a geofence warrant. And counsel, it looks like that your geofence warrant does in fact uh, incorporate the room where the homicide is alleged to have occurred. But the court does notice that the geofence, I should say that really what you would think would be the focus or the, the center of that circle would be where the crime occurred. Whereas your geofence uh, has it really sort of in at, at the edge. And I can understand that part of that may have been to incorporate um, one or both of the hallways, but it does still seem to encompass a rather large area, um, such as courtyard, where um, there wouldn't have been any evidence of the crime. Do you think that perhaps it should have been a bit more um, focused? No, Your Honor. This geofence was particularized and it wasn't overbroad because the detective knew that he had particularized, that she had particularized probable cause to appear in Sunshine Suite in the adjacent two hallways. Therefore, she centered her geofence around those two, those three points. But, but isn't it true that the geofence doesn't have to be a, a, a circle? The geofence essentially can be any shape. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. So, so then why not just focus on the two hallways without uh, drawing the geofence such that it does incorporate areas on the streets and the courtyards and again all of these other areas that seems to be somewhat gratuitous doesn't it no your honor because the detective specifically states that when um, obtaining her geofence that she accounted for the margin of error and that is why she made her geofence this specific shape and size all right you can go ahead and proceed thank you in matter of search warrant application regarding arson investigation, police sought metadata for six separate locations. But each one of those locations, the um, case indicated, was for a very brief period of time, the time that the arson actually occurred, as well as a very um, limited area. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. The, the fact stated that it was geographically small and limited in time. However, it is not stated exactly what small and limited in time means. That could range from five minutes to an hour for when the arson occurred. Thank you. As in this case, the, court, the warrant in matter of search warrant application regarding arson investigation specified the time and location for the geofence data. In upholding the warrant, the court stated that the geographical area was small and limited in time. The same is true here. Detective Perrin limited her search to a 75-foot radius and limited it, her search to 11 p.m. the night of the killing. Assuming for the sake of argument, uh, particularly because that uh, phase of the search was approved by a magistrate, then how do you justify, given the cases that we have uh, cited, how do you justify the expansion to four hours? There, there was never a second warrant sought to justify that degree of expansion. Is that correct? No, Your Honor. The probable cause that founded the first warrant expanded to the, to the four hours because the time of death, as determined by the medical examiner herself, was that four hour time period from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. You may proceed. Furthermore, the facts in today's case are extremely similar to our most recent binding precedent of Price v. Superior Court of Riverside. There, 
Police obtained a geofence warrant due to a drive-by shooting for a 22-minute time period, including the victim's front yard, porch, and the length of two houses in either direction. They then expanded the time frame to before and after the 22-minute time period for all of the cell phones within the geofence without obtaining a second warrant. Then they proceeded to de-anonymize two of those phones. Court understands all of that. Um, but let's move on to uh, the notion that there may not have been a good faith here, uh, given the fact that, in, that courts, including um, the Mesa Court and the Chattery Court, have strongly suggested that a second warrant would be uh, advisable and preferable in a situation like this. Yes, Your Honor. The detective did not find it necessary to obtain a second warrant because she thought that the probable cause that founded the first warrant extended to the ability to de-anonymize the five individuals. Well, isn't that the same argument, perhaps, that was used in Mesa and Chatry? Uh, yes, Your Honor, and both of those courts upheld the good faith exception, partially because of scant judicial precedent. That fact still holds today. People v. Meza was decided a mere three months before the detective obtained and executed this geofence warrant. But uh, in the case of, the, in the Chatry case, uh, the court noted specifically the legality of the geofence warrants was unclear overall. And even though the detective, act, detective acted in good faith, the court, quote, nonetheless strongly cautions that this exception may not carry the day in the future if the government is to employ these um, geofence warrants. Isn't that a, a very strong and clear indication that officers moving forward should get a second warrant, especially when getting de-anonymized data? Your Honor, that is purely circumstantial. In today's case, the probable cause that somebody had to go into Kieran Sunshine Suite and physically stab him shows that the detective should have had the ability to de-anonymize the information of people who were near this, the suite. The good faith exception should apply because even though three of those people were not connected to this case, the detective took care to make sure that even the court today doesn't know the identifying information of those three individuals. Well, the court may not know it because it was kept confidential, but the officers knew it, the detective knew it, and so the court's question here is that the information was de-anonymized after the detective already knew that the individuals with those devices had not been anywhere near the victim's uh, room. Isn't that correct? It, it had already been established that they were moving in and out of another room that was near hallway B and sometimes even outside of the geofence range. Isn't that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Some of them went outside the geofence's range. However, the geofence does not account for vertical positioning. So the detective needed to use a margin of error. He believed that these phones were close enough to Kieran Sunshine's suite to be able to, um, to have gone in and stabbed him. Thank you. You may proceed. Furthermore, Your Honor, the detective in today's case had successfully obtained five prior geofence warrants, and these were all approved by different magistrates. This goes to show that there was no police misconduct. Well, I wouldn't necessarily say that because the magistrates had no information or no control over what the officer did after they approved the warrants, correct? They approved the warrants that they saw for the limited time and the um, geofence but they did not approve uh, getting the de-anonymized data, correct? And they did not approve expanding uh, to four hours the time frame. Your Honor, we can look to the, pri the, to the case of Price v. Superior Court of Riverside for that. And this is our most recent binding precedent, and their police not only expanded the time frame, they expanded the time frame for all of the cell phones within the geofence, as well as de-anonymize the information of two. They took all of this action without obtaining a second warrant. The court nonetheless still held that not only the original warrant was valid, but also that the detective was acting in good faith while executing it. Detective Perrin in today's case took care to reduce the number of phones when he expanded the warrant to the only he thought who were viable to have gone into Kieran Sunshine's suite. And 
And isn't it true, though, in the Price case that um, where the court clearly um, sanctioned what the officers had done in all three phases, that um, only two of the devices were de-anonymized, and that was the device of the victim in the case and the device of the um, suspect, the defendant? Yes, Your Honor. That is, analog that is extremely analogous to today's case where it was, there were originally 80 phones and the detective took care to only de-anonymize the five he thought were the most likely to have been able to go into Kieran Sunshine Suite. Thank you, you may proceed. In the case of United States versus Chaudhry, during a bank robbery investigation, police obtained a geofence warrant with a 300 meter diameter. A federal court held that this was overbroad and thus invalid. However, the search was upheld under the good faith exception because the police in that case had successfully executed multiple similar warrants and because they had clear probable cause to search the area. But in, but in that case, number one, didn't the facts involve knowledge that the suspects had gone into another building, thus having to incorporate the, the second building other than the bank, and also a total of 19 phones uh, were found to have been within that expanded geofence. So, so much fewer than the 80 uh, phones in this particular case. So doesn't, isn't that a significantly distinguishable characteristic? No, Your Honor. As, as the court said, the results of the geofence warrant aren't necessarily uh, used to evaluate the validity of the warrant. The detective could not have known who or how many phones he would have captured by this geofence warrant. Just as the court, the warrant in Chaudhry, the police didn't know there what they would have captured with that geofence warrant. That is actually why the geofence warrants are obtained in the first place, is to see who was in that specific area. Thank you. Your Honor, the detective specifically states when obtaining the warrant that this was in part to corroborate or refute possible witness alibis. Therefore, the ability to de-anonymize certain individuals was included within the first warrant because locational data alone would have been useless for this purpose. Let me just ask you one more question while you're uh, paused for a moment. I'm going back to the Chantry case that you have cited to support your argument that the warrant was uh, within an acceptable scope and that there was good, uh, a good faith. Isn't it true that from the 19, in that case, the detective did narrow the list to nine users and then ultimately um, only requested de-anonymized uh, de data for those nine users? Yes, Your Honor, that is exactly what we see in today's case. The detective took care to limit the time frame expansion to only those he thought viable the five phones that we see today. And then he de-anonymized all five of those phones because he believed that all five were still viable options based on the time frame expansion. He took care to preserve the, the privacy of all 80 individuals. And do you agree with the court in the Chaudhry case that in fact, um, like the Chaudhry case, the warrant here was overbroad and the detective had too much discretion um, so do you concede that point? In other words, is your argument more one of good faith? Uh, no, Your Honor. The geofence in today's case was not overbroad as it was based on the particularized probable cause that the detective had by that point, as opposed to United States versus Chaudhry, where they saw where they saw geofence data for an entire two buildings without particularizing it to the places where they could have been. They saw data for only Kieran Sunshine's room, the two adjacent hallways, and limited space in between those. Thank you, you may proceed. Furthermore, Your Honor, the detective in today's case only saw metadata. We can look to Stanford v. State of Texas, in which a warrant saw writings regarding the Communist Party. <coughs> The Supreme Court overturned this warrant and stated that substantive data is held to a much higher level of particularity than any other types of data. Your Honor, the detective only saw metadata in today's case. There was no substantive data at any step within the process. Are you saying that uh, substantive data would not include other phone numbers that were called from these numbers and the fact that they were either texts or numbers you, because it's not content? Yes, Your Honor. Substantive data in today's case would have been the substance of any calls or text. 
However, for 75 of these 80 phones, there was no de-anonymizing information or identifying information for the information to be tied to actual people. Therefore, the Fourth Amendment rights of those people were not violated. Thank you. Because this geofence was not was sufficiently particular, it was and was within the scope of the probable cause, and because the detective clearly acted in good faith, we ask that you deny the defense's motion. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. And does the defense have a rebuttal at this time? Yes, Your Honor. May I proceed? Please. Thank you. The prosecution states that the geofence is not only particularized, but centered around Karen's room. But this is completely incorrect, Your Honor. It was not particularized, given the fact that it included area clearly unrelated to the crime, Fifth Street and Great Avenue. Additionally, Your Honor, additionally, Your Honor it was not centered around Kieran's room. Rather, as you mentioned, Kieran's room was in the corner of the geofence. Instead, Detective Perrin could, could have created a geofence that was centered around Kieran's room and only consisted of the hallways around. But um, what is your response to the argument that, in, in fact, the um, geofence was drawn the way it was to incorporate those areas where suspects may have been. So in other words, uh, the 75 foot diameter incorporated the margin of error that um, Google has indicated it has and to have moved the circle would have made it incorporate uh, even more irrelevant areas uh, in the street. Wouldn't you agree with that, given the map that we have? Well, Your Honor, I do not think that Detective Perrin necessarily should have moved the geofence, rather created a more pointed geofence that can be shaped in any way or form and created one that was sufficiently particularized, perhaps cutting off the, the streets around or only focusing on Karen's room. You may go ahead and proceed. And um, just uh, the court is very interested in your position with regard to a good faith argument. So even if the court were to agree with, were to agree with you with regard to the um, scope, overly broad scope of the warrant, um, what about the good faith argument given that the court just uh, months earlier in the Mesa case found that there was good faith in a very similar set of facts? Yes, Your Honor. Um, I do believe that Detective Perrin did not act in good faith today in our case. The prosecution states that Detective Perrin didn't find it necessary to go back and get a second warrant. But reviewing the cases we have before us, U.S. vs. Chartree and People v. Mesa, Detective Perrin should be studying these cases as a part of their job, as a part of their commitment um, to being a good police officer and acting in, in good faith, and that should have transferred that into their work in this case and gone back to the magistrate and got a second warrant. But they did not do this, and I think this is a prime example that they did not do all that they could to act in good faith. But you would agree, uh, the police officers are multitasking, they're not attorneys, that, uh, so they're not necessarily going to be as uh, fluent in all of the recent cases uh, as an attorney would. Yes, Your Honor, I know that Detective Perrin is not going to be spending hours reviewing these or is not going to be as well versed, but I do think that as a police officer, he does have a bit of a responsibility to know the rulings that are going on and to um, improve his own work given these past rulings. You may proceed. Thank you. Additionally, the prosecution mentions the arson case, but this is completely different from our case as there are multiple geofences that were small and limited in time. And the prosecution states these small and limited in time periods as five minutes to one hour. Then how would our four hour period be considered small and limited in time? It would not. Therefore, we know that the geofence created was overbroad and executed not in good faith by Detective Perrin, Your Honor. Detective Perrin should have gotten back to go get a warrant. He should have created a geofence that was more... Let me just ask you, counsel, are you aware of how big those areas were? Because I believe that counsel's response to the court's question in that regard was that um, we don't have in the information before us how, um, how great those six areas were, and it was six areas that they um, got information about. Yes, Your Honor. Well, it was six different areas, and we do not know the exact parameters. Um, the court, or the case law does state that they were small and limited in time, and I do not believe that our um, geofence given is small or limited in time, given that it was expanded to four hours. And what's the objective standard to determine that when your opposing counsel is saying it is small, uh, the area that we have, and you're saying it's not small. Who, where do we find uh, within our case library 
what the correct definition of small is. Well, Your Honor, I think um, U.S. versus Lofsted does a good, shop, a good job of showing this. There might not be certain parameters of how many feet or how many hours is small and limited, but it does state that the scope of a warrant should be limited by the probable cause on which it is based. And I think that Detective Perrin did not create the geofence to be limited by the probable cause surrounding ours. But you would agree that really none of, not, not even with regards to uh, the defendant's uh, phone, as far as we're aware, was there anywhere near the amount of um, data seeking that there was in uh, the case that you cited? Because that case involved essentially going in and getting all of the information from the defendant's phone. Um, uh, all content. Here there's really no content other than location data that was ascertained. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor, that is correct, but I think still using the ideas behind Lofsted and um, additionally a lot of the cases we have in front of us do not have as big of a time period as ours going from four hours and even when we go into the second stage of the warrant and go into the five phones, um, I think that is still very important to note that three of those phones had nothing to do with the crime. Um, as you stated, or as opposing counsel stated, Price, they de-anonymized two, which is still very different from ours, which de-anonymized five, three of which were unrelated to the crime. In Price, they only de-anonymized the information of the victim and um, the defendant. And I think ours is distinguishable here because three of the people who were simply walking around the hotel, their information was exposed due to this investigation that they had no part of. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, in conclusion, Your Honor, Detective Perrin did not do all that they could to act in good faith. Did they, they did not create appointed and sufficiently particular geofence. They did not return to the magistrate to do all that they could to protect the information of these uninvolved personnel. But, but the standard really is not somebody doing all that they could and being perfect, again, in hindsight, looking back 2020. The, the standard articulated in Leon was um, even where there are minor transgressions, the exclusionary rule um, would not apply because that is intended to deter, um, suppose, intentional bad uh, police conduct. And that's, you've talked a lot about negligence, but I didn't hear you say anywhere that officers were trying deliberately to unlawfully rifle through people's personal information. Well, Your Honor, I do think one example of Detective Perrin um, not acting in good faith is starting the time period of the fence at 11 p.m., even though um, he knew that the, uh, the victim was alive at the time of 11.10 and also was given the previous information that Toby Clark was walking around at 11 p.m. I think t instead of starting the geofence pointedly at 11.10, knowing that the victim was alive at that time, um, Detective Perrin chose to start the geofence at the time of 11, knowing that they had previous information that could have tied that information to I mean, we're, we're actually... Um splitting hairs here, aren't we? We're talking minutes, and, and somebody just isn't dead right away. In other words, at 11 o'clock, it's reasonable to assume that there would be somebody in the area where the ultimate homicide occurred. It, it, isn't that fair? Especially um, for an officer who may be trying to limit the scope of the warrant. Well, Your Honor, yes, I do think it is a few minutes, but I do think if Detective Perrin was trying to limit the scope of the warrant, um, they would have started at the last point in time when they knew the victim was alive. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. In conclusion, we request that you exclude all evidence from the geofence from this case today. Thank you. Thank you so much, counsel. And uh, do you have a rebuttal as well from the people? When you asked opposing counsel to state any precedent supporting their position on bad faith, there was simply no precedent that pointed to the fact that Detective Perrin was acting in bad faith. There's only precedent in multiple cases that points to good faith. In all of People v. Meza, United States v. Chaudhry, and Price v. Superior Court of Riverside, it all shows that what Detective Perrin did today was all in good conduct. Um. Let's just uh, unpack that a little bit. So with regard to Chaudhry and Mesa, and we've been talking about these cases quite a bit today because those are the geofence cases as, as well as Price. 
But um, in, in both of those cases, the court gave a very stern warning, as your opposing counsel has indicated. So at what time and at what point does the court say, okay, enough, um, we've told you uh, time and time again that this is, this is too broad. Uh, when are you going to start uh, getting a second warrant or narrowing the focus of your search? Your Honor, that point in time, we don't know exactly when that point in time is. However, there is only five cases in our precedent that even pertain to geofences, and they are all within the span of the last four years. The most recent one, Price v. Superior Court of Riverside, and the one before that, Meza, and the one before that, Shotry, they all ruled in good faith. This scant judicial precedent still applies today. How, however long it applies for is still unknown. Well, in Price, they didn't really even need to get to the question of good faith. Is that correct? Because the court found that the warrant there was sufficiently narrow. Yes, Your Honor, the court did find that it, the warrant itself was valid, but they also said at the very end, I believe at the last sentence of the holding, that the detective no, nonetheless still acted in good faith while executing it, even though they did not return to a magistrate for a second warrant. Okay, so um, how does that compare to uh, the breadth argument? Because the, the warrant in that case was much narrower in terms of its breadth than the warrant that we have here. Yes, Your Honor, the breadth in Price v. Superior Court of Riverside, or, it was much narrower because they knew exactly where the crime had occurred, exactly where the perpetrator was, and exactly when the crime had occurred. Isn't that exactly what we have here? We have somebody who was killed in a room, so we know where the crime happened, and we know where the perpetrator must have been because there was only one door in and uh, one door out, and it was the same door, so it was probably even more narrow than a home with a porch uh, on a street, which is where the crime in Price occurred. So wouldn't it have made sense to have uh, as at least as narrow a geofence in the uh, current case as there was in the Price case? No, Your Honor, because the time of death was a four-hour period, so the four-hour period held. Um, because this was a dense, urban, highly populated environment, as the detective knew, this made the margin of error much larger than some, than in a place where there is low foot traffic, like Price v. Superior Court of Riverside, and therefore more, more action had to be taken to make sure that the margin of error <clears throat> didn't affect the search. Thank you. And your Honor, opposing counsel brought up the cost versus benefit analysis laid out in United States versus Leon. We can see in today's case that the benefit of suppressing the evidence, well, there simply is none. Maybe it would have the detective apply for a second warrant. However, a second warrant wasn't even necessary in today's case. The probable cause that founded the original warrant extended to the ability of the detective to de-anonymize the five individuals. So there is no benefit to suppressing the evidence. However, the cost, the cost of suppressing the evidence shows that this ping here, number two, clearly shows that Toby Clark was near or at the murder scene at the time of the murder. So I guess um, when we're talking about the benefit, the benefit would be to ensure that there is oversight. So for example, um, if the court were to find that there was not good faith here, given the precedent that suggests a second warrant should be sought, then uh, wouldn't that have the benefit of making sure that there is judicial oversight for warrants that are asking for even more uh, information, and especially de-anonymized information moving forward? That's the benefit, isn't it? Your Honor, while that may tr be true, it is stated nowhere directly in our precedent that a second warrant is necessary. And actually to this fact, there is a clear three-step process laid out in the pretrial fact situation. And in the second and third steps where you can broaden or narrow the time frame and you can de-anonymize the information of individuals, it is nowhere stated in there that a second warrant is necessary or even it should be obtained. But, but then we get back to the shot, I believe it was a shot tree case that said, we don't know that this is a legal process. This is a process that uh, people have come up with as we are trying to explore this new technology, but um, doesn't it make good sense as an excess of caution to start following the 
using the precautions that the courts are suggesting that you use so that you don't find yourself suddenly uh, with a case where you don't have evidence because the court has drawn the line. Your Honor, while that may be true, suppressing the evidence could actually suppress acts of good faith in today's case. The detective took clear steps to limit the intrusiveness of her investigation. She attempted to limit the invasion of privacy as for all of the 80 phones. She made sure to limit her probable cause, her, <clears throat> excuse me, her warrant to the places where she had particularized probable cause and to only extend it outward from there because of the margin of error. She made sure to make to make her warrant the smallest possible size while avoiding mistakenly ruling out anybody who could have been in Kieran's suite. Detective Perrin was acting in good faith, and the exclusionary rule, as laid out in United States versus Leon, can only be applied if there were acts of bad faith or if the warrant was facially deficient. Thank you. Your Honor, opposing counsel also argued that this case was similar to People v. Meza in the fact that it was overbroad. However, in the case of People v. Meza, it searched multiple locations throughout the span of an entire day. Today's search at the first stage was only one minute for a radius of 75 feet, which is smaller than almost any precedent that we have. 30 seconds. The detective in today's case was clearly acting in good faith while executing the warrant. And because they had successfully executed five prior geofence warrants, they were simply acting in corroboration with how they had before. For these reasons, we ask that you deny the defense's motion. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And at this time, both sides have submitted, or we have? OK, very well. And does either side wish to uh, consult with their team or their team captains? Yes, Your Honor. Under the 30-second rule. The people see no irregularities. All right. And the defense? No, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Very well. Uh, once again, the court, having reviewed the points and authorities previously, uh, first of all, wants to commend both counsel because your uh, answers and your willingness uh, to answer all of the court's questions have helped to focus the court's thoughts at this particular juncture. And the court recognizes that we are in um, an evolving area of the law. Uh, the court does find that the uh, warrant was overly broad, not necessarily at the outset with the geofence, but the court was concer extremely concerned with um, de-anonymizing the four, uh, I'm sorry, the three uh, phones that uh, apparently suggested uh, had been ruled out as involved in the crime. However, the court also finds that there has not been bad faith in this particular case. The court finds that uh, the officers were not trying to gain an advantage um, over the defendant. They were certainly not trying to get substantive material from uh, any of the phones um, similar to what had occurred in the uh, Loftus case. And so the court is respectfully going to deny the defense's motion to suppress, and the evidence will be admitted at the trial. Um, thank you. Yes, Your Honor. May we have a moment to rearrange? Yes, please. Yeah. 
All right, once again, we are here in the case of the people of the state of California versus Toby Clark, who is present with his legal team from Stevenson, and the people are represented by their legal team from Carmel High School. And at this time, both sides are ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor, the people are ready to proceed. And the defense is ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. All right, and do the people have any exhibits be that they would like to introduce first? Yes, Your Honor, we ask that exhibits A through G be marked for identification. All right, no objection from the defense? None, Your Honor. All right. Uh, we'd ask uh, that the bi bailiff place an exhibit binder at the witness stand that opposing counsel has pre-approved for convenience during the trial. Very well, no objection from the defense? None, Your Honor. All right, so we will ask the bailiff to please place the exhibit binder on the witness stand for the convenience of the witnesses. Any further exhibits? None, Your Honor. And does the defense have any exhibits that they wish to have marked at this time? Not at this time, Your Honor. All right, very well. Then uh, uh, the people may proceed with their opening statement. Your Honor, prior to proceeding, we ask that all witnesses be constructively sequestered, barring the defendant. Yes, absolutely. All witnesses will be excluded. So if there are any witnesses in the courtroom uh, who will be testifying, they may kindly step outside of the courtroom until they are called. Uh, Your Honor, to clarify, we are asking for constructive sequestration, which means they are allowed to be in the courtroom. Uh, however, they cannot testify to other testimony heard during the trial. Very well. And uh, the defense uh, agrees with that process? Yes, Your Honor. All right, very well. All witnesses are instructed not to discuss their testimony until the cause has been concluded. Thank you. And you may proceed. Grant Shu for the people. May it please the court. It's July 16th, 2023. Kieran Sunshine, the CEO of Sunshine Medical Components, and Toby Clark, the defendant, are arguing. They're arguing because Mr. Sunshine intends to tell the board of SMC that the defendant concealed problems with Foreverflex, the company's new joint replacement technology. If he does so, the defendant will lose his job his law license, and even his freedom. That was a risk the defendant couldn't take. So he killed Kieran Sunshine. As a result, the people have charged the defendant with first degree murder. To meet our burden, we must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he did so with premeditation and deliberation. We will meet that burden. Today, you will hear from Jerry Moyad, Kieran Sunshine's personal advisor. She will tell the court that when Mr. Sunshine first found out about the problems with Foreverflex, he wanted to tell the board immediately. The defendant pressured him to do otherwise. Ms. Moyad will also tell the court about an argument she overheard moments before Mr. Sunshine's death. Detective Nova Perrin will describe a champagne saber she recovered from the crime scene. She will also tell the court about a silk scarf she recovered during a search of the defendant's home. She will explain to the court how geofence data places the defendant right outside Kieran Sunshine's room the moment he was murdered. Dr. Casey Vasquez, the county medical examiner, reviewed the physical evidence she determined that champagne saber to be the murder weapon. You will learn that the defendant's fingerprints were found on that champagne saber. She will also tell the court how fibers from that silk scarf matches fibers found on Kieran Sunshine's suit. Finally, Amari Sunshine. Mr. Sunshine's younger sister will tell the court about the noticeable tension between the defendant and Mr. Sunshine in the months leading up to Mr. Sunshine's death. Amari Sunshine will also tell the court that she saw the defendant heading towards her brother's room the night he was murdered. 
At the end of today's case, it'll be clear that if Mr. Sunshine told the board about Forever Flex, the defendant would lose everything. That was a risk the defendant couldn't take. So he killed Kieran Sunshine. We will ask you to find the defendant guilty of first degree murder. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. And does the defense wish to present their opening argument at this time or after the people's case? At this time, Your Honor. All right, you may proceed. Thank you. On July 16th, sometime after 11 p.m., Kieran Sunshine was murdered in his room at the Bells Hotel, killed with a saber my client gifted him hours earlier. Your Honor, this gift is the only thing tying Toby Clark to the death of Kieran, and the prosecution knows it. The evidence will show that Kieran's killer is his lifelong rival and sibling, Amari Sunshine. Amari was a guest at the Bells Hotel that evening, staying just down the hall from Kieran's room. After killing Kieran, Amari, a gifted and malicious schemer, framed Toby Clark for the murder. Your Honor, the prosecution's case is merely grasping at straws, and their hands have come up empty, with unreliable witnesses and physical evidence that points nowhere near my client. Although Detective Pren, early in her investigation, rightfully focused on Amari as a suspect, she got sidetracked after interviewing Amari and prematurely eliminated Amari as a person of interest. As for the fingerprint evidence, Toby Clark left prints on the saber handle because he had literally held it when giving it to Kieran as a gift. The evidence will show the government cannot account for the other prints found on the saber, nor can the government refute the fact or the possibility that the killer wore gloves. Tonight, you will hear from Arian Sunshine, Kieran's sibling, who will describe Amari's treacherous nature and behavior. Arian will also talk about how Amari coveted the corporate CEO position and was angry when their father bequeathed it to Kieran. Next, you will hear from medical expert Dr. Turner, who will testify to the fact that Toby Clark was physically incapable of wielding the saber in a deadly manner. Then you will hear from Toby himself, who will describe his close relationship with Kieran Sunshine. Toby will also describe his shock and dismay when Kieran blindsided him with the news he would lie to the board about the clinical test results. The evidence will show that Toby spent the rest of that day processing this betrayal and ultimately decided he would retract the product's patent application. Finally, you will hear from Nick Yang, Toby Clark's law school classmate, who will describe Toby's steadfast loyalty and compassion. Your Honor, the prosecution's case is grasping at straws, latching on to whatever they can get their hands on. The evidence clearly points away from my client and towards Amari Sunshine. At the end of this trial, the defense will ask you to find Toby Clark not guilty. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. And you may call your first witness. The people call Jerry Moyed to the witness stand. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you are about to give will faithfully and truthfully conform to the facts and rules of the mock trial competition? I do. Please state your first and last name and spell your last for the record. My name is Jerry Moyed. M-O-A-Y-E. Thank you. You may be seated. You may proceed whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, Ms. Moyed. Good afternoon. What do you do for a living? I'm a holistic wellness coach and a, a former personal advisor to Kieran Sunshine. What was your relationship with Mr. Sunshine like? It was amazing. Kieran and I were always really close. We worked together to improve his mental well-being. Do you know Toby Clark? Yeah, I, I knew Toby. Toby was a lawyer for SMC. Ms. Moyed, I'd like to talk to you about the day of January 3rd, 2023. Did you see Mr. Sunshine that day? I did. I saw Kieran rush into Toby's office and close the door behind him. 
He didn't come out for a whole other hour. But when he did, he seemed totally different. Did you ever find out what happened in that meeting? I did. Kieran told me that there was some sort of issue. Objection, Your Honor, here, sir. Any um, <coughs> exception that you would like to state? Yes, Your Honor. This is a statement against interest. May I be heard? Uh, you may. Kieran Sunshine, as the CEO of um, if this witness would be allowed to testify, she will state that Kieran Sunshine uh, found out about problems with Foreverplex. As the CEO of Sunshine Medical Components, uh, him, his admission that there are faults with his own product would absolutely be a statement against interest. All right, and uh, the court does find that that exception would apply here, so the objection is respectfully overruled. Thank you, Your Honor. And you may answer. Well, uh, Toby, or Karen told me that there was an issue with one of uh, SMC's new products, Forever Flex, and that Toby had convinced him to lie to the board about it. Let's talk about the day of July 16th, 2023. Where were you that day? I was inside the Bells Hotel. We were all there getting ready for the upcoming board meeting. What's the first thing you remember that morning? Well, I remember waking up to the sound of the shouting coming from Kieran's room. It was Kieran and Toby having some sort of argument. Do you remember what they were arguing about? I do. I heard Toby shout something about how much trouble the Protection kids are going to be in. Would you like to be heard? Yes, Your Honor. This is a statement by Toby Clark. As such, it's an admission by a party opponent. All right, and that exception does apply here, so the exception, uh, the exception applies and the objection is respectfully overruled. You may proceed with your answer. Ms. Moyad, I'll ask the question again. Uh, do you remember what they were arguing about? I do. I heard Toby shout something about how much trouble the two of them would be in. Was that the only argument you heard that day? No. Again, later that night, around 11.10, I heard even more shouting coming from Karen's room. Again, it seemed to be some sort of argument between Toby and Karen. What did you hear the defendant say this time? I heard Toby shout, You would ruin everything! Did you see Mr. Sunshine after this? I did. The next morning, Karen and I had yoga scheduled. I walked into his room. I saw him lying there, on the floor, in a pool of his own blood. Thank you, Ms. Moyad. Your Honor, I have no further questions at this time. Thank you, Counsel. Cross-examination. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Ms. Moyad, you're a holistic wellness coach, correct? I am. And you got your job at SMC as a holistic wellness coach? Uh, yes, about five years ago. Okay. And uh, in order to apply for this job, you had to submit an application with a resume, correct? Yes. And on this resume, you stated that you had a credential from a well-known holistic health college, right? Yes, on my application, I said I had this degree that I didn't have. So I told Karen six months in for the job. But you lied on your application? Uh, yes, at first. All right. Now, uh, you were good friends with Karen, right? Yes. In fact, you had a deep friendship. Yes, we were working for on his mental health. You were his personal coach for five years? Yes. Now, you were not friends with Toby Clark, were you? Uh, you know, we weren't as close. I didn't work uh, as closely with Toby. You didn't trust Toby Clark, did you? I... I can't say that I did. You thought he was an obstacle to Kieran's healing process, right? Yes. In fact, is it true that Toby Clark frequently mocked your entire profession? Well, he called my job all that woo-woo stuff, if that's what you're referring to. Alright, let's move to the night of July 16th. Now, you heard some voices coming from the other room around 11 p.m., right? Yes, it was some shouting. Okay, and you couldn't hear the voices as well as you could earlier that day, right? Um, they were slightly muffled, but it seemed to be an argument between Toby and Karen. And you weren't sure that it was Toby Clark then, correct? I couldn't be 100% sure, but it definitely sounded like him. At no point during this time did you hear somebody cry out in pain, correct? Uh, no, I heard lots of shouting. At no point did you hear somebody fall to the floor, right? Uh, no, I didn't hear any commotion, just shouting and yelling. So at no point did you feel the need to call the police, right? No. 
And at no point did you feel the need to even call hotel security, correct? No, I just thought it was another one of Toby and Karen's arguments. So you just took your shower and went to bed? Yes, after that, I took my shower and went to bed until the next morning. All right, just a couple more questions. Now, on the morning of July 17th, after you had witnessed Kieran's body and were walking in the hallway, you saw a blue latex glove in the trash can, correct? Yes, I saw this glove um, in the trash can by the elevators. And you told Detective Perrin about this glove? Yes, I mentioned it. Thank you. No further questions, Ron. And at this time, any redirect? No redirect, Your Honor. May this witness be excused? Yes, uh, by the defense as well? Yes, Your Honor. All right, thank you very much. You may be excused and you may call your next witness. The people call Detective Nova Perrin to the witness stand. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you are about to give will faithfully and truthfully conform to the facts and rules of the mock trial competition? I do. Please state your first and last name and spell the last for the record. Nova Perrin, P-E-R-R-E-N. Thank you. You may be seated. And you may proceed whenever you're ready, counsel. Good afternoon, Detective Perrin. Good afternoon, ma'am. How long have you worked as a detective? I've been a detective with the Kingsley County PD for about eight years now. What's your role in today's case? Lead investigator. And how are you qualified to act as the lead investigator? I've successfully managed dozens of homicide cases. I'm certified in forensic investigation and analysis, along with geofence technology. Now I'd like to talk about July 17th of 2023. Did you respond to a 911 call from the Bells Hotel that day? I did. And what did you first find when you arrived at the scene? <laughs> Upon arrival, I was greeted by an individual named Jerry Moyet, who had found the victim's body. Did you examine that body? Yes, ma'am. I entered the suite and I found the decedent, Kieran Sunshine, laying on his back in the living room. There was a wound to his upper right abdomen and I estimated the time of death to be approximately 11 p.m. the night prior. Detective, did you collect any other physical evidence from the scene? I did. I seized a champagne saber and recovered five red and blue silk fibers from the decedent's suit sleeve. Would you please turn to what's been marked for identification as Exhibit F in the binder in front of you? I have it here. Do you recognize this? I do, ma'am. This is the saber I found at the crime scene. The people offer Exhibit F into evidence. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. Exhibit F is admitted at this time. Detective, what did you observe in your examination of this saber? I noticed that the blade is 13 inches long, approximately six of which is covered in blood. I also lifted two sets of fingerprints from the hilt of the saber. Were you able to identify who those sets of fingerprints belong to? Yes, ma'am. By fingerprinting all witnesses in today's case, as well as comparing the fingerprints to the National Fingerprint Database, I matched the first set to an individual named Toby Clark. Would you recognize Toby Clark if you saw them in court today? Yes, ma'am. He's sitting at the end of defense counsel's table, wearing a black blazer. Identifying the defendant for the record. Uh, what about that second set of fingerprints you mentioned? Ma'am, they didn't match any witnesses in today's case or anyone in the National Fingerprint Database. So what's the next step that you took in your investigation? At this point, I named Amari Sunshine as a person of interest and Toby Clark as a suspect. Were you able to rule out either of these individuals? Yes, ma'am. Eventually, I ruled out Amari Sunshine as a person of interest. And how did you go about doing that? Well, according to the geofence, Amari uh, Sunshine's phone pinged nowhere in the location, um, as well as the forensic investigation uh, did not lead me to think that Amari Sunshine was any way involved, including eyewitness testimony. Did you investigate the defendant further? Yes, ma'am. I applied for a search warrant, and I discovered a red and blue silk scarf in his home. You mentioned earlier a geofence. Would you please explain what a geofence is? Yes, ma'am. It's a virtual boundary that accounts for all cell phone activity within a given point at a certain time. Did you use a geofence in today's case? Yes, ma'am. What did you learn from the geofence data? 
the defendant was at or near the scene of the crime at the estimated time of death. Did you also conduct any interviews of note? Yes, ma'am. In which two witnesses placed the defendant at the scene of the crime at about 11 p.m. So, to be absolutely clear, was the champagne saber the only piece of evidence that connected the defendant to this murder? No, ma'am. Oh, did you end up making an arrest in today's case? Yes. I executed an arrest warrant and took the defendant into custody on August 3rd, 2023. Thank you. Your Honor, I have no further questions. Thank you. Cross-examination. Yes, Your Honor. <coughs> now, Toby Clark met with you voluntarily, correct? That's right. Accompanied with his lawyer. And he answered all your questions, right? Yes. And he provided you with the DNA sample? Yes, and fingerprints. Okay. Now, Clark told you that he had given the saber as a gift to Karen on July 16th, correct? Objection, Your Honor. Hearsay. Did you wish to be heard? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Uh, this is a uh, party mission. Did you wish to be heard to that response? Uh, yes, Your Honor. In Rule 8, Section M, excuse me, Rule 9 M, admission by a party opponent can only be offered against uh, that party. Uh, as the defendant is the party of the defense side, this exception does not apply here. And that is a true statement of the law. Did you wish to be heard further? Uh, I can rephrase the question, Your Honor. All right, the objection is sustained. Motion to strike. Motion to strike uh, is granted. You may proceed. Did you learn that Toby Clark had given a saber to Kieran as a gift on July 16th? That's what he had claimed, sir. Objection, Your Honor. Lack of foundation. Sustained. You know, if I may be heard? You may. I believe this is a stipulation that Clark had given the saber to uh, Kieran. If there is a stipulation between counsel as to a uh, aspect of testimony that could be introduced and um, considered by the court, then the court certainly will receive a stipulation. Uh, yes, Your Honor, submitted in that case. Okay, so that piece of evidence then is accepted by stipulation, regardless of whether or not it would otherwise be admissible. Uh, so uh, Toby Clark would have handled the saber before giving it to Karen? That, that's a possibility, yes, sir. All right, and uh, you also, uh, the blue silk, red and blue silk fibers, you collected this as evidence, correct? I did. They were located on the suit sleeve jacket of the decedent. And you learned that Kieran had given the scarf as a gift to Toby Clark on July 16th, right? Yes. So Kieran would have handled the scarf before giving it to Clark? That's, that's a possibility, yes, sir. All right, let's talk about the uh, bloody shoe print. Now, the shoe print was made by a size 41-42 magnet, right? That's correct. A shoe brand originating from Belgium in size 41 to 42 European. Now, Clark owns this type of shoe, correct? Yes, previously. However, he was unable to locate them to give to me or forensics. And Jerry Moyd owns this type of shoe, correct? Yes, previously. And Amari Sunshine owns this type of shoe, correct? Correct, sir. And they all wore sizes that matched the print? Yes, sir. Let's talk about the uh, fingerprints on the saber. Now, the fingerprints were consistent with someone holding the saber with their right hand, correct? That's right. Now, Toby Clark is right-handed, correct? <clears throat> yes. And Jerry Moyd is right-handed, correct? From my knowledge, that, that's right, sir. And Amari Sunshine is right-handed, correct? Yes, sir. All right. Moving on to the uh, geofence data. Now, you narrowed down your search to five phone numbers, including Clark's, from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., right? Correct. And one of the other numbers was Jerry Moyad's, right? Yes, Jerry Moyad's phone pinged inside uh, her hotel room the entire time. And there were three other uh, numbers, but you determined they had no connection with this case, correct? That's right. You didn't include Amari Sunshine's number in the final data set for analysis? No, because their phone did not ping in the proximity. Now, Amari uh, claimed to have been in her room at 11 p.m. when she allegedly saw Toby Clark walking down the hallway, right? Yes, sir. And uh, when you drew your geofence data, you did not draw it to include Amari Sunshine's room, correct? No. So you wanted to use geofence data to look at Toby Clark's alibi, but you chose not to use it to look at Amari's. I didn't exclusively um, do it because of Amari Sunshine wasn't in it. I did it in proximity to the crime scene at the estimated time of death, which would aid in my investigation, sir. Now, you knew that Amari Sunshine was originally a person of interest in this case, correct? Yes. And you formed that opinion after learning that Amari stood to inherit Kieran's 30% share in the event of uh, Kieran's death, correct? Objection, Your Honor. Lack of foundation. <coughs> Would you like to respond? Uh, no, Your Honor. All right, then the objection is sustained. You may lay a foundation if you would like. 
Okay. Uh, in your interviews, did you learn that uh, Omari stood to inherit Kieran's 30% share in the event of Kieran's death? Objection, Your Honor. This question calls for hearsay. Any exception? Uh, no, Your Honor. All right, then that objection is sustained. All right. So, you see here today, you cannot tell the court what the geofence uh, data shows for Amari's location between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m., the time frame of the murder. Is that correct? I can tell you that Amari Sunshine's phone did not ping in proximity uh, to the victim's suite. At 11 p.m., correct? Uh, between the time that I uh, wrapped us, yes. Okay, thank you. No further questions. Thank you. Any redirect? No redirect, Your Honor. May this witness be excused? Uh, she may, if she may be excused by the defense at this time? Uh, yes, Your Honor. All right, very well. And you are excused. Thank you so much. And you may call your next witness. Prior to proceeding, Your Honor, I'd like to request a time check on behalf of both parties. Of course. Your Honor, the prosecution has seven minutes and nine seconds remaining, while the defense has four minutes and 20 seconds remaining. All right, thank you. Your Honor, may I construct, uh, may I set up an enlargement of Exhibit F? This has already been admitted into evidence. You may. You may proceed. The people call Dr. Casey Vasquez to the witness stand. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you are about to give will faithfully and truthfully conform to the facts and rules of the mock trial competition? I do. Please state your first and last name and spell your last for the record, please. My name is Casey Vasquez. That's V-A-S-Q-U. Easy. You may be seated. And you may proceed whenever you're ready. Uh, Your Honor, I'd like to note that pursuant to stipulation three, Dr. Vasquez is a qualified expert in the field of forensic pathology. Thank you, so noted. Good afternoon, Dr. Vasquez. Good afternoon. What do you do for a living? I'm the chief medical examiner for Kingsley County. How are you involved in today's case? I reviewed all of the forensic evidence pertaining to this case, as well as Dr. Turner's report, and I conducted a post-mortem examination on Kieran Sunshine. Let's talk about that autopsy. What did you determine the cause of death to be? Kieran Sunshine died of uncontrolled hemorrhaging, resulting from a stab wound to his upper right abdomen. What caused that stab wound? A champagne saber found on scene. I determined it matched both notching in the ribs as well as microscopic edges of the lacerations. Let's talk about that champagne saber. Your Honor, may this witness step down to make use of the enlargement? She may. Are you able to see your own? I am, thank you. Were there any fingerprints found on this champagne saber? Yes, there were two sets of fingerprints, one lower on the hilt and one higher on the hilt nearest to the blade. The one higher on the hilt is consistent with someone gripping the saber. May the record reflect that this witness gestured lower on the exhibit near the hilt and higher up close to the blade. So noted. Thank you. Dr. Vasquez, were you able to determine whose fingerprints were found lower on the hilt? I was given the fingerprints of Amari Sunshine, Jerry Moya, <coughs> and the defendant, and I determined that set of fingerprints belonged to none of those people. Were you able to determine whose fingerprints were found higher on the hilt? The fingerprints higher on the hilt, consistent with someone gripping the blade or gripping the saber, belong to the defendant. Thank you, Dr. Vasquez. Your Honor, may this witness return to their seat? She may. Thank you. Are the fingerprints the only evidence connecting the defendant to the crime scene? No. There were also silk fibers found at scene. 
Were you able to determine where those fibers came from? Yes. I compared them to a silk scarf found in the defendant's home, and I determined they were identical in both material and coloration. And now, you also mentioned that you reviewed Dr. Turner's statement. Are you familiar with her conclusion about the defendant's shoulder injury? Yes. Dr. Turner believes that a shoulder injury the defendant sustained in college would have made it difficult for him to wield the saber in this case. I disagree with that conclusion. Why do you disagree? I reviewed the MRI of the defendant's shoulder, and while there is scar tissue present, it's important to note that the saber in this case weighed only two and a half pounds. That's not enough to prevent the defendant from wielding it in the manner that killed Kieran Sunshine. Thank you, Dr. Vasquez. Your Honor, I have no further questions at this time. Thank you, Counsel. Cross-examination. Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Dr. Vasquez. Good afternoon. You examined the champagne saber in this case, correct? I did. And you would agree that there were multiple sets of fingerprints on the saber? Yes, that's true. Now, one of these fingerprints belonged to Toby Clark, right? Yes, the one higher on the hilt. Now, from your cumulative review of all evidence in this case, you would agree that Toby Clark purchased the saber as a gift for Kieran Sunshine, right? That's right. You would also be aware that Toby Clark handled the saber with his hands on July 16th? That's a possibility, yes. And you would also be aware that none of the other fingerprints on the saber were matched to any other witness or person in this case? That's right. I was able to rule out anyone involved in this case. Doctor, is it fair to say that you are making an assumption that the killer was not wearing gloves? No. Why? Would you agree that a gloved killer wouldn't leave their fingerprints on the saber? Yes. And you are aware that there was a glove found in the hotel trash can, correct? Yes. However, uh, considering all of the evidence, it is unreasonable to assume that the killer was wearing gloves. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you, Counsel. Any redirect? No redirect, Your Honor. May Dr. Vasquez be excused? Uh, she may. Thank you very much, Dr. Vasquez. And uh, she may be excused by the people as well. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. All right, thank you. And you may call your next witness. I may I take down the exhibit? Please. Prior to calling our next witness, we'd like to request a time check on behalf of both parties. Of course. Your Honor, the prosecution has four minutes and eight seconds remaining, while the defense has three minutes and ten seconds remaining. The people call Dr. Amari Sunshine to the witness stand. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you are about to give will faithfully and truthfully conform to the facts and rules of the mock trial competition? I do. Please state your first and last name and spell your last for the record, please. Amari Sunshine, that's S-U-N-S-H-I-N-E. You may be seated. You may proceed. Good afternoon, Dr. Sunshine. Good afternoon. What do you do for a living? I was the Vice President of Research and Development at Sunshine Metal Components, my family's business. But now, I'm CEO. Did you know Kieran Sunshine? Of course. Kieran was my brother. We used to work together. Do you know the defendant, Toby Clark? Yes. He was the in-house legal counsel for my family's business. What did you observe of the relationship between the defendant and your brother? They were close friends. I almost never saw them apart. Doctor, did that ever change? It did. After a meeting they had on January 3rd of 2023. Did you see either of them on January 3rd? I did. I saw Kieran storm into Toby's office carrying a stack of papers. He shut the blinds and when he came out an hour later, he looked really stressed. So what was it that changed about their relationship after that meeting? Well, Toby and Kieran just didn't seem to talk to each other anymore. And Kieran acted hostile to pretty much everyone I saw him interact with. I'd like to talk about July 16th of 2023. Where were you that day? I was at the Bells Hotel. 
Toby and Karen were hosting a big IPO announcement for SMC on the 17th. I didn't think we needed to do it at a big, famous hotel, but that's just me. Did you notice anything unusual that evening? I did, actually. Around 11 p.m., I heard loud voices that sounded like they were coming from the hallway. Did you investigate that noise? I did. I opened up my door in the hallway to see if anyone was out there, but all I saw was Toby rounding a corner at the end of the hallway. Well, if the defendant was at the end of the hallway, how did you know it was him? I mean, I've worked with him for several years. Uh, do you know what hallway the defendant was turning into? The North Hallway. Uh, Dr. Sunshine, had you ever been in the North Hallway before? Yes. My brother Kieran Sweet was in the North Hallway. Was your brother staying in the North Hallway the night of July 16th? He was. Doctor, did you ever see your brother again after July 16th? No. Never. He was killed that night. Thank you. Your Honor, I have no further questions. Thank you. Cross-examination. Yes, Your Honor. Now, you and your father were at odds over SMC when he died, right? I wouldn't say we were at odds over SMC, but rather my interests. And you say that this is why he chose Kieran to be CEO and not you? Uh, objection, Your Honor. Hearsay? Would you like to be heard? Yes, Your Honor. This was the witness's own statement. So long as it's the witness's own statement, would you agree? Uh, that it's... Go ahead. Would you like to be heard? Is it a prior out-of-court statement? Yes, Your Honor. This is a prior out-of-court statement being quoted directly from this witness's statement. It's still an out-of-court statement being used in court for the truth of the matter, regardless of the fact that the declarant is on the stand. Are you seeking to admit this testimony and the statement for a uh, the truth of the matter or for a non-hearsay purpose? For a non-hearsay purpose, Your Honor. And can you articulate that purpose? Yes. Now, you and your father were at odds over SMC and you believe this is why he chose Kieran to be CEO and not you. Correct? I'm still going to sustain the objection. You may rephrase if you'd like. All right, Your Honor. Now, you didn't like how Kieran ran the company, right? We had our differences. And in your statement, you say that Kieran and Toby were inseparable, correct? Objection, Your Honor, hearsay. Um, if you are laying a foundation for a prior uh, inconsistent statement or consistent statement, you may lay that foundation, but the objection to hearsay would otherwise be sustained without an exception. May I lay a foundation, Your Honor? You may. Now, Kieran wouldn't speak with you in the months leading up to July 17th, correct? I wouldn't say that. In fact, he told you to butt out when you asked about the Forever Flex test results. He did say that, yes. And now you didn't like how Kieran ran the company, correct? We had our different ideas on how to continue my father's <coughs> legacy at SMC. And you even disapproved of having the <coughs> meeting at an expensive hotel, right? Well, I thought the conference room we had at SMC would be just fine, but... Kieran said he wanted to impress new shareholders. And when Kieran died, you inherited all his corporate shares, correct? Yes, that's correct. You became the majority shareholder? I did. Now, you checked into the Bells Hotel on July 15th, correct? That's correct. You were there for the board meeting? Yes. You had a room on the 10th floor? I did, that's correct. The same floor that Kieran was staying on? Yes, it was. And you were in your suite alone that day, correct? I'm sorry, what day is that? On July 16th. On July 16th, I had visited Kieran in his suite, but then I returned to my suite for the rest of the day. And you met Kieran in his suite and you saw his room layout, correct? Uh, yes, I did. You saw a saber on the fireplace mantle? I did. And you went back to your room? Yes, that's correct. And you were in your suite alone all day, preparing for the board meeting? Yes, I had work to do for the board meeting. And you were in your suite at 11 p.m.? Uh, yes, I was, until I heard loud voices coming from the hallway, I believed. Yes, it was around this time that you saw someone in the hotel hallway, correct? Yes, that's correct. If you'll turn your attention to Exhibit B, do you believe this to be a fair and accurate representation of the 10th floor of the Bells Hotel? Uh, 
Yes, it looks to be a correct representation. And the person you saw was at the end of hallway C, correct? Yes. And this was quite a long hallway, right? Um, I believe it was... Objection, Your Honor? Our competition rules uh, provide that a team must enter an exhibit into evidence before having a witness testify to its specific contents. Um, that would be also consistent with the law, and this once again is exhibit... B. B, which has not yet been admitted, is that correct? That's our understanding, Your Honor. All right. How would you like to proceed? Your Honor, given that the witness has identified this as a fair and accurate representation of the 10th floor of the Bells Hotel, may we, ex we ask you that we admit exhibit B into evidence, Your Honor? Any objection? None, Your Honor. All right, thank you. The exhibit is admitted at this time. Thank you. And the person you believe to be Toby Clark was seen at the end of hallway C, correct? Yes, that's correct. And this was, again, quite a long hallway. I wouldn't say so. According to this map, it was, in fact, 225 feet long, right? I'm not sure of the exact number. But still, even though it was quite a long hallway, you believed the person at the end of this hallway to be Toby Clark, correct? Yes, that's correct. And you were alone when you saw this person? I was. Thank you, Your Honor. I have no further questions. Thank you. Anything further? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Redirect? Yes. <laughs> Dr. Sunshine, is it true that you're now CEO of SMC? Yes, it is. Did you want to become CEO of SMC? Not particularly. My interest always lied with science, not business. I actually have a PhD in biomedical engineering. Doctor, did you kill your brother in order to become CEO of SMC? No. I love, loved Kieran. I did not kill him. I couldn't ever do something like that. Thank you. Your Honor, I have no further questions. May Dr. Sunshine be excused? She may. Is she may be excused by the defense? Yes, Your Honor. All right. You may be excused. Thank you. And the people rest. People rest at this time. Any evidence from the defense? Exhibit B, Your Honor. All right. I believe Exhibit B was already admitted to evidence, correct? Yes, Your Honor. All right. And do you have any witnesses you'd like to call? Yes, Your Honor. The defense called Arian Sunshine to the stand. All right. Arian Sunshine. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you are about to give will faithfully and truthfully conform to the facts and rules of the mock trial competition? I do. Please state your first and last name and spell your last for the record. Arian Sunshine. S-U-N-S-H-I-N. You may be seated. You may proceed. Thank you. Ms. Sunshine, what is your profession? I'm the Vice President of Marketing at SMC. And do you know a Kieran Sunshine? Yes, Kieran was my older brother. How would you describe your relationship with Kieran? We got along well. And did Kieran have a role at SMC? Kieran was the CEO. Now, do you know an Amari Sunshine? Amari is my eldest sibling and the Vice President of Research and Development at the company. And how would you describe your relationship with Amari? We got along moderately well throughout our lives. And are you familiar with Amari's relationship with Kieran? Yes. Could you describe it? It was a very troubled relationship ever since they were young and did not get better as they got older. Does our particular event come to mind? Yes, the scholarship incident. Could you elaborate? Well, Objection, Your Honor. Improper character evidence. Would you like to be heard? Yes, I would, Your Honor. This goes to the credibility of a critical government witness as an ind and is indicative of prior bad acts on that witness's behalf. Your response? Your Honor, the way I heard the question was opposing counsel asking this witness about a specific incident. I believe this is uh, using character for a specific instance conduct. And so uh, your position is that although somebody may be able to impeach um, with a specific incident, that is not the purpose for which this uh, is being proffered at this time? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Your response? Your Honor, this goes to the dishonesty of Mari Sunshine, which is proven to be in the mock trial fact pattern or fact packet, in which it states that if dishonesty or the credibility of a character is being mentioned and used as and used in, as character evidence, it is in fact admissible. All right. The court is not sure how a, a quote unquote I think it was a scholarship incident that was referred to uh, necessarily. 
uh, is indicative of credibility. What is your proffer? If the witness may explain this incident, I believe this matter will be resolved. Counsel, would you like um, your opposing counsel to go ahead and give the proffer before the court rules on whether or not the witness can answer the question so the court has some context? Yes, Your Honor. All right, you may go ahead and uh, proceed uh, with your proffer, not with the witness testimony, but what is the evidence that you are expecting the witness to testify to if the court um, overrules the objection? Your Honor, the witness will testify to the fact that Amari had concealed the results of Kieran's acceptance into college uh, prior in pr about 20 years ago when this um, when he had been accepted into his dream college, showing that Amari is in fact capable of concealing a crime. All right, and so your position is that is how this per per relates to credibility, not to quote unquote bad character. Is that correct? It is also indicative of bad character in the idea that... But it may not be admissible for that purpose, correct? Yes. All right, counsel? Your Honor, opposing counsel is using this specific incident to illustrate a history of a strained relationship between Kieran Sunshine and Amari Sunshine. This is evidence of propensity, not credibility. Um, thank you, counsel. I do think that in the way that the evidence was proffered, uh, there is a relevance to credibility in that it was the concealment aspect of the evidence. So the court is going to respectfully overrule the objection and the evidence may be presented. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Please explain this incident. Yeah, so Kira got a full ride scholarship to his dream college, but he never found out about it because Amari got into his email and blocked all letters from that college and also took the physical mail when it came. By the time the offer, the deadline to accept the offer had passed, Amari told Kieran we were all in the room together, and Amari laughed when Kieran became visibly upset. And you said their bad relationship continued into adulthood. Could you explain? Yeah. When our dad announced that you wanted Kieran to be CEO, Amari got angry and retaliated. How did Amari retaliate? Well, one day after he said that, dad's vintage Bronco disappeared and showed up a month later trashed and found by the police. I saw Amari selling the stereo to the Bronco in... Objection, Your Honor. Improper character evidence. And what is your response? Again, Your Honor, I believe this goes to, the, uh, to Amari's credibility as a critical government witness and the fact that he has concealed crimes for a, the duration of his youth to his adulthood. Did you wish to respond with regard uh, to, I believe she's asking to introduce it as... Um, conduct of moral turpitude, perhaps. Yes, Your Honor. This specific instance of Amari uh, stealing a car and uh, later reselling it is evidence of uh, the poor relationship between Amari Sunshine and Kieran Sunshine, specifically as it relates to their father's will. This is, a, a, this is character evidence being used to show conduct in conformity. Thank you, uh, counsel. It clearly cannot be used to show conduct in conformity, but what we have here is a, a murder, not a auto theft. Um, the court is going to allow the evidence for the limited purpose of impeaching the credibility of, of uh, Imari. Thank you, Your Honor. And now you said their bad relationship continued into adulthood and Imari had dealt with this uh, stereo of the Bronco. Could you please continue? Your Honor, may I re-raise my character objection? Opposing counsel just mentioned she's using this to show a history of bad uh, character between the two. Correct. And for that purpose, the, that incident would not be admissible. So as the court indicated, the incident with regard to the stolen vehicle pertains only to credibility. It may not be offered as um, conduct um, in conformity with conduct alleged to have occurred here. Now, why do you think your father made Kieran the CEO? Well, Kieran had the business knowledge to continue my father's legacy while Amari had medical technology. And what happened after Kieran became CEO? After our father passed, the shares were split. Amari got 50, Kieran got 30, and I got 20. And Kieran was also made the CEO, but his position and his shares would go to Amari if anything happened to him or he stepped back. Objection, Your Honor, lack of foundation. Uh, the court is going to go ahead and sustain at this time. You may lay a foundation if you can. Motion to strike? Uh, at this time, yes. Let's move on. Turning to July 16th, were you at the Bells Hotel? Yes. Why? I was there for the meeting on the 17th. <coughs> and
Simon, did you overhear an incident in which Toby used the term bloodbath in a hotel meeting room? Yes. And could you explain? I was talking with Jerry Moyad outside the meeting room when Toby came out and said, if this doesn't get fixed, there's going to be a bloodbath. And then he came towards us and said the staff was incompetent. Objection, Your Honor. Hearsay. Do you have an a, a exception? Yes, Your Honor. This was an excited utterance. Did you wish to respond? Yes, Your Honor. We agree that the first part may be considered an excited utterance. However, Toby uh, Clark explaining why uh, they later made that statement uh, shows that they have calmed down enough to make an explanation. This is not an excited utterance. And the court would agree with that as to the latter part of the statement. So the first part of the statement is in with regard to, I, I believe the statement may have already been introduced by the people, but the latter part would not be admissible as an excited utterance. You may proceed. Motion to strike, Your Honor. To strike that portion of the answer, yes. Now, did you speak with Karen on July 16th? Yes, I went and talked to him after that. And where did you speak with Karen? I went to see him in his suite. And did you happen to observe anything on the fireplace mantle while you were in his suite? I saw a saber on the mantle and Karen told me it was a gift from Toby. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you. Cross-examination. Good afternoon, Miss Sunshine. Good afternoon. You were at the Bells Hotel on July 16th, isn't that right? That is correct. Directing your attention to what's been marked for identification as Exhibit E in the binder in front of you? Yes. This is a scarf. You saw the defendant wearing that day. That is correct. Is it a fair and accurate depiction of that scarf? Yes. The people offer Exhibit E. Any objection? All right, the exhibit is admitted. This was the same scarf you saw the defendant tugging on in the afternoon. Yes, that is correct. Oh, later that day, as you mentioned, you visited Kieran in his room? Yes. That was on the 10th floor of the Bells Hotel? Yes, that is correct. In the north hallway? It is where he resided. Please. Let's talk about some of the incidents you mentioned on direct. You never saw Amari Sunshine threaten Kieran, did you? No, I did not. You've never seen Amari Sunshine act violent towards Kieran? No. Thank you, Miss Sunshine. Your Honor, I have no further questions at this time. All right. And... Your Honor, may this witness be excused? Yes, and may be excused by the people as well? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. And the defense may call its next witness. Calling Dr. Parker for the Senate. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give will faithfully and truthfully conform to the facts and rules of the mock trial competition? I do. Please state your first and last name and spell your last for the record. Thank you. You may be seated. You may proceed. Doctor, what is your occupation? I have been a forensic pathologist for 20 years. Can you summarize your educational background? Yes, I have a bachelor's degree in chemistry and I'm currently a medical doctor. Have you testified as an expert in criminal trials before? Yes, I have. Do you typically testify for the defense or for the prosecution? I testify for both sides. Were you asked to review medical records and evidence for this case? Yes. Did you review the champagne saber? Yes. And in your professional opinion, could Toby Clark have used this saber with sufficient force so as to cause the fatal wound? No. Please explain. Of course, the champagne saber is typically dull and lightweight meaning the perpetrator may need to use significant force when driving it into the abdomen. Given the large amount of scar tissue that I examined via an MRI, Toby Clark could not have generated that amount of force. Doctor, are you familiar with the fingerprint evidence? Yes. What is your opinion on its reliability? It is not reliable. Toby Clark had handled the saber, um, including he gave it to Karen as a gift, so naturally he would have left fingerprints on the saber. <coughs> Additionally, there were the second set of prints that were not identifiable. What is your opinion on the reliability of the silk fiber evidence? Again, this is not reliable. Kiernan had handled the scarf prior to giving it to Toby Clark and in the same clothes that it was found in on July 17th. Doctor, what is your opinion on the reliability of the shoe print evidence? It's inconclusive. The actual shoe that left the print was never found. Doctor, are you familiar and experienced with computer technology and the use of police investigations? Yes, I am. And are you familiar with the geofence evidence in today's case? Yes. And what is your opinion on its reliability? Objection, Your Honor. Calls for an improper expert opinion. 
Would you like to be um, heard? Yes, Your Honor. Although this witness just testified that they have a background with computer um, enhanced investigation techniques, we've heard nothing as to how this witness would have any experience or expertise with geofence data specifically. Your response? Your Honor, it is a stipulated fact that this witness is an expert in, uh, in the case, and this includes the geofence evidence. I believe that I may have seen that, but I will rely on counsel with regard to the stipulations. Your Honor, at the beginning of this witness's testimony, she testified that she was serving as a forensic pathologist. She simply has a background in computer-enhanced investigation techniques. All right. Um, then perhaps pursuant to the stipulations and the rules, the witness can or you can lay the foundation through the witness as to any further expertise. Your Honor, I asked if they were familiar with computer technology, not if they were an expert in it. So I'm a little bit confused by this objection. I think what counsel's objection is, is having her testify as an expert in an area where she has not yet said she is an expert, but it sounds as if there may be a stipulation and therefore a basis upon which she can testify that she is an expert in that area as well. Is that correct? No, Your Honor. The stipulation simply states that Dr. Parker Turner and Dr. Casey Vasquez are qualified experts and can testify to each other's statements. We believe that to mean that they are experts in forensic pathology, which is what this, uh, what this witness initially stated. All right. So counsel's position is that this uh, new area of expertise does not fall within the stipulation. However, um, she may be able to still be qualified, and you may lay a foundation if you, if you, should, if you would like. Doctor, are you experienced with the use of computer technology in criminal investigations? Yes, I am. And have you reviewed the geofence evidence in this case? Yes, I did. And in your opinion, is this geofence evidence reliable? Your Honor, I'd like to re-raise my objection. Would you like to voir dire on the expertise before the court makes a finding of whether or not she's an expert? Your Honor, I can also take this up on cross. All right, excellent. All right, you may proceed. Would you like me to repeat the question? No, it's okay. Um, I believe it is a gross exaggeration of the geofence data to assume that it proves Toby Clark was near the victim's room at the time of the murder. The only thing that the geofence data conclusively proved is that Toby Clark's cell phone was in the Bell's Hotel on the night that Kiernan died. <coughs> Additionally, a geofence data has a known margin of error of hundreds of feet, particularly when pulling data from buildings with multiple floors. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. All right. And you may proceed. Doctor, I'd like to talk to you about the geofence technology you mentioned on direct. You don't mention any experience you had previously with this technology? Well, I do have some uh, knowledge regarding geofence, uh, geofence uh, data. Doctor, you made a report in today's case. Uh, regarding, are you regarding the, what I just said in my direct? Yes, doctor. You made a report in, today, in preparation for today's case. Um, I, I'm sorry, can you please explain? Did you make a report in preparation for today's case? Yes. And in that report, nowhere do you mention that you've worked with geofence data before. The Objection. Your Honor, according to stipulation three, Detective Perrin is a, excuse me, Dr. Casey Vasquez uh, may testify and has reasonable knowledge from the fact situation and can testify to the geofence technology. All right, I think that the question of whether or not she can testify has already been answered by the courts ruling, as I understand it, counsel's asking questions um, as cross-examination to impeach the opinions that may have been rendered. So that is within the scope of, accessible, of um, acceptable cross-examination because her opinion is currently in. You may proceed. I'll ask it in, Dr. Vasquez. You don't mention any training you have as it relates to geofence technology. I'm sorry, do you mean Dr. Turner? Uh, yes, Dr. Turner. My apologies. I'm uh, sorry, can you please uh, restate the question? Of course. You don't mention any experience you have with uh, geofence technology, do you? I have used it before. I, I know of geofence, yes. You made a report in today's case? Um, yes, I believe I did. And nowhere in your, that report do you mention any previous experience you had. 
Um, I, well, I didn't uh, go into detail about my previous experience, no. Let's talk about the champagne saber in today's case. You didn't examine the saber in person? Um, no, but I did uh, see the two fingerprints, one that was Toby Clark's and the other that was unidentifiable. Bring you back to my question, Dr. Turner. You didn't examine the saber in person? No, I did not. You don't know how sharp it is? Well, I do know that champagne sabers are typically dull and lightweight, meaning a perpetrator would need to use significant force. When Objection, Your Honor, non-responsive. Overruled. That answer is in. Uh, Dr. Turner, you don't know how much force it would take for the saber to kill someone. Not a direct number, but what I, as I just said, since they are dull and lightweight, I do know that it, it would need significant force. You're aware that there are two sets of fingerprints found on this champagne saber? Yeah, yes, they're Toby Clark's and then also an unidentifiable. The one belonging to Toby Clark is consistent with someone who is gripping the saber. Uh, well, yes, and uh, since Toby Clark had given it to Kiernan as a gift, it is uh, natural that he would, let, uh, would have left fingerprints on the saber. Is that a yes to my question? Uh, Toby Clark's fingerprints are consistent with someone gripping the saber. Uh, yeah, since he gave it as a gift. Thank you, Dr. Turner. Your Honor, I have no further questions at this time. All right, thanks, you can, thank you, Counsel. Any further uh, direct examination? No, Your Honor. May this witness be excused? And she may be excused by the people as well? Yes, Your Honor. All right, you may be excused. Thank you. And your next witness. Calling Toby Clark to the stand. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you are about to give will faithfully and truthfully conform to the facts and rules of the mock trial competition? I do. Please state your first and last name and spell your last for the record. Toby Clark, C-L-A-R-K. Thank you. You may be seated. Good afternoon, Mr. Clark. Good afternoon. What is your occupation? I work as general counsel at SMC. Do you have a law degree? I do. Any particular specialty? I am a certified patent specialist. And what kind of company is Sunshine Medical Components? Sunshine Medical Components is a medical technology company. And what do you do there? I work as general counsel, meaning I will advise on legal matters where I can, negotiate com company contracts, and submit patent applications. And how long have you worked as general counsel? Around eight years. Mr. Clark, why did you decide to become a patent attorney? I suffered a right, an injury to my right rotator cuff during a lacrosse game. And luckily, I had early intervention and did not require a prosthetic for my injury. However, it was due to this incident that I became aware that people like me did not have access to high quality medical care. And that's why I chose to work in law. I wanted to help make this degree of medical care available for all. And who was SMC's CEO in 2023? Kieran Sunshine. Did you work with Kieran Sunshine? Yes. When I started at SMC in 2015, Kieran was my boss and he slowly became quickly became one of my closest friends. Now, were you working at SMC on the morning of January 3rd? Yes, I was. What, if anything, happened this morning? Kieran came into my office to talk to me about some ForeverFlex testing results, a new product. And what did Kieran tell you? Kieran informed me that tests that had been run on the ForeverFlex were positive and the product was confirmed to be working smoothly. Was this good news? Yes. The ForeverFlex was an upcoming product by SMC, and it would have been a game changer in the prosthetics industry because it boasted a significantly longer um, lifetime than other prosthetics. Would the ForeverFlex have benefited the company? Yes. Once sales of the ForeverFlex began, revenues were projected to increase. Would you have benefited financially? Yes. All executives at SMC would have received financial bonuses. So after that January 3rd meeting, what did you do? I began to work on the patent application for the ForeverFlex. I started to work longer and harder. I started to contact hospitals and doctors, and I even contacted a friend at the U.S. Patent Office to put a rush order in on the application. And when you signed that patent application, were you aware of any problems with the ForeverFlex testing? During my meeting on January 3rd, Kieran had informed me of a small problem that had occurred during the testing. However, had assured me that the problem was minimal and it was being handled and everything was going, and the product was in fact working, and I trusted him. Why did you want the patent filed so quickly? I put a rush order on the application because I wanted it complete by the time of our July 17th board meeting. Do you know Amari Sunshine? I do. Who is she? Amari Sunshine is Kieran's sister.
And did you have a meeting with Amari Sunshine in March of 2023? Yes, I did. What happened at this meeting? Amari came to me to inquire about some testing results for the Forever Flex that she had received. <clears throat> and what did you tell Amari? I told Amari what Kieran had informed me, that the Forever Flex did have a small problem, but it was being fixed and everything was going well for the board meeting. Objection, Your Honor, hearsay. Did you wish to be heard? Clarify, is this hearsay as to Kieran's statement about a small problem? Uh, this is hearsay as to the defendant testifying to what they said. So the court is going to go ahead and sustain the objection as to that. Motion to strike. Motion to strike is granted. Thank you. Mr. Clark, do you like Amari Sunshine? No, I do not. Objection, Your Honor, relevance. Overrule. Please explain. Well, it is my opinion that Amari is more concerned with power and status than doing any actual real work. And it's for this reason that I believe she was jealous of Kieran. Objection, Your Honor, lack of foundation. Sustained. Motion to strike. The uh, motion to strike is granted. Now, moving on to the board meeting, when and where was this meeting going to happen? July 17th at the Bells Hotel. And who is going to present the Forever Flex to the board? Kieran, and I was going to co-present with him. Did you meet with Kieran before the meeting? I did. I met with Kieran on July 16th in his suite at the Bells Hotel at around 9 a.m. There, I gifted him a champagne bottle and a champagne saber, and he gifted me a scarf, which I wore for the entirety of that day. However, I, it was during that confrontation I noticed he looked troubled, so I asked him what was bothering him. Objection, Your Honor. Lapsing into narrative. Um, I'll go ahead and sustain that. You may ask your next question so that it does not become a narrative. And what happened in this meeting with Kieran? In this meeting with Kieran, he informed me that the clinical trials that had been done on the Ferberflex showed its metal caused bacterial infections within patients. Apparently, he had known this since January 3rd. Then what happened? Kieran told me, I realized that I had been lied to. Kieran had lied to me. And I realized that the patent I had signed was based on false information. I should have checked the results myself, but I had trusted Kieran because he had done all the research and he was my friend. Mr. Clark, how did you respond? I, Kieran told me that he was going to lie to the board to buy time because in truth, SMC was in financial trouble and if the Forever Flex failed, we could go bankrupt. So then what happened? I begged Kieran to tell the truth, but he refused, so we started to argue. At this point, how did you feel? I was shocked. I was betrayed. My friend, who I had known for eight years, had lied to me. Did you see Kieran later that day? Yes, while we were setting up a meeting space for the board meeting that would happen the next day. Did you lose your temper during this meeting? Admittedly, yes, I did. During, while we were setting up, the staff ran into technical problems with the projector, and I yelled at them, there's going to be a bloodbath if this isn't fixed. And where was Kieran when this happened? Kieran was behind me when I made my comment, as we were both walking out of the meeting space. And who was this comment directed toward? I directed my comment towards the hotel staff. Would you see Kieran after this? No, I went back to my room for the rest of the day. And what did you do for the rest of the day? I worked and prepared for the board meeting. As it was around 11 p.m., I finally left my room to go to the 24-hour gym at the hotel. Did you see anyone while you were in the gym? No, I was alone. How long were you in the gym? Around two hours. Mr. Clark, let's move to July 17th. Did you go to that board meeting? No, I did not. Why not? <laughs> I couldn't sit there and bear watching Karen lie to the board, so... I left the hotel at around 5 in the morning to run some errands and clear my head. At some point that day, did you learn Kieran Sunshine died? It was around 12 when I finally charged my phone and realized I had three or four missed calls from Aaron Sunshine. Apparently they had found Kieran in his hotel suite, stabbed. At this point, Mr. Clark, how did you feel? I was devastated. I knew Karen and I had argued, but I knew we would get over it. I knew we'd be friends again, but now we, didn't, we wouldn't have that chance. Did you speak with Detective Perrin? Yes, I did. What did you tell Detective Perrin? Uh, objection, Detective Your Honor, this question calls for hearsay. Did you wish to respond? Uh, no, Your Honor. All right, the objection is sustained. Lastly, 
Mr. Clark, did you kill Kieran Sunshine? No, I did not kill my best friend. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. Cross-examination. Your Honor, prior to proceeding, may I have 30 seconds to confer with co-counsel? Of course. Your Honor, prior to proceeding, I'd like to request a time check on behalf of both parties. Go ahead. Your Honor, the prosecution has six minutes and 29 seconds remaining, while the defense has two minutes and six seconds remaining. Thank you. You may proceed. Mr. Clark, I'd like to talk about January 3rd of 2023. You testified on direct examination. You had a meeting with Kieran Sunshine that day. That is correct. In which he told you the Forever Flex results were amazing. Correct. According to you, that's all you two discussed in that meeting. I came away from that meeting with that conclusion. But that meeting lasted an hour long? Correct. And when Kieran Sunshine entered, he closed both the door and the blinds of your office. That is correct. Two days later, you filed for a patent for Forever Flex based on what you learned of the results. Correct. Well, Mr. Clark, you had access to those Forever Flex test results starting January 3rd. That is correct. As corporate counsel, I would have had access to those results. And you're aware that the information contained in the patent application you filed is false. Correct. I based my patent off of what Kieran had told me, and I did not check myself because I trusted him. I'd like to be clear. That means if you did, in fact, know about the Forever Flex test results when you filed for that patent application, you could be found liable for fraud. I'm sorry, could you rephrase your question? If you knew about the Forever Flex test results when filing the patent application, you could be found liable for fraud. You understand that, right? That is correct. Now, as far as you know, not a single other person knew about the problems with Forever Flex. No, that's my understanding. As far as you know, not a single other person knew that you knew about the problems with Forever Flex. On January 3rd, I did not know about such problems. I was only made aware of them on July 16th. Kieran Sunshine was the only person who knew you knew about those problems, isn't that right? Kieran informed me of these problems on July 16th. But if it came to light that you had known about those problems, Mr. Clark, you could lose your job at SMC. That is correct. You could lose your law license. That is correct. You could even go to jail. That is correct. I'd like to talk about the board meeting on July 17th of 2023. Uh, you spent months preparing for this board meeting. Correct. You even expedited a patent application for the sake of presenting it at this board meeting. That is correct. Now, you testified on direct examination about an argument you had the day prior with Kieran Sunshine. Correct. Around 9 a.m.? Correct. According to you, that's when Kieran Sunshine told you he planned to lie at the board meeting. Correct. That is when he revealed to me the truth about the Forever Flex results. And you testified that you couldn't stand to watch him lie the next day. That is correct. I wanted to remove myself from that situation. But Mr. Clark, isn't it true that you continued preparing for the board meeting the entire rest of the day after that argument? That is correct. I made my decision that night. You took marketing calls? That's correct. You even set up the meeting space with Kieran Sunshine? Before the marketing calls, but after our initial meeting, yes. But as you testified, you decided to skip the board meeting sometime later that night. That is correct. Your phone died that night? Correct, when I was in the gym. You didn't bother charging it? I did not. You left the Bells Hotel the next morning at 5 a.m.? That is correct. Your phone was still powered off? That is correct. You didn't inform a single person you were leaving the Bells Hotel? That is correct. You didn't inform a single person that you were skipping the board meeting. That is correct. And as you testified, you were supposed to co-present at that board meeting. That is correct. When you left the Bells Hotel, you went immediately to get your car cleaned. That is correct. I did go run some errands. And immediately to dry clean all of your clothes. Correct. It was then, Mr. Clark, that you finally felt calm. You could say? You felt calmer because you had fled the scene of Kieran Sunshine's murder. Objection argumentative and badgering the witness. 
It's a bit argumentative. Withdrawn, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. I have no further questions. And uh, anything further redirect? No, Your Honor. May this witness be excused? He may. And so, Mr. Clark, you go, go ahead and take a seat back next to your attorney. Any further evidence from the defense? Uh, the defense calls Nick Yang to the stand. All right. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you are about to give will faithfully and truthfully conform to the facts and rules of the mock trial competition? I do. Please state your first and last name and spell your last for the record. Nick Yang, Y-A-N-G. Thank you. You may be seated. You may proceed. What is your name? Nick Yang. And how old are you? I'm 45 years old. And what is your occupation? I'm an entertainment lawyer in New York City. Oh, what is your relationship with Toby Clark? Uh, we went to law school together, and he's a good friend of mine. How do you describe Toby Clark in law school? Uh, he was really kind and helpful. I mean, he even won an award for working the most pro bono service hours, even though we were working hard. Objection, Your Honor. Improper character. Did you wish to be heard? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Go ahead. The character evidence to the uh, defendant's character is admissible. Your Honor, may I be heard? You may. Pursuant to Rule 8, Subsection 1, the defense may offer positive evidence of the defendant's own character via opinion or evidence of reputation. This falls under specific instance conduct, which is only permissible on cross-examination. You may uh, rephrase your question. Your Honor, so, if I, if I, yes, go ahead. Uh, this is not one specific instance. This witness knew Toby Clark throughout law school. And so that is a way that the court heard this evidence, that it was really more character of uh, generosity and such, not a specific incident. Go ahead. Your Honor, it's our understanding that this witness specifically testified to a humanitarian award that the defendant had earned in law school. This is what our objection is directed towards. All right. Did you wish to be heard further on the specific issue of the humanitarian award? No, this, this witness will testify to multiple instances of Toby Clark's good character, not just this specific award. I think that's exactly what the objection is. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. All right. So you may, the witness may testify as to the good character of the defendant for any character that is relevant, character trait that is relevant to the offense for which he is uh, on trial, and actually credibility as well because he has testified as a witness, um, but not specific instances of, con of uh, conduct. Uh, what was Toby Clark's character like in law school? Uh, I mean, he was really kind and helpful. He was always helping other people with their work or studying. And did his behavior change after law school? No, not at all. He became a patent attorney because he wanted to work in the tech sector and make medical care more accessible. Objection, Your Honor. Speculation. Uh, the court is going to go ahead and sustain that unless a foundation can be laid, and that could call for hearsay. A motion to strike pending foundation? Yes, that motion is granted. Uh, how do you know uh, that he was... Um... <coughs> Sorry, can you repeat the, your answer to the previous question? Yes, he had said that he wanted to become a patent attorney because he wanted to work in the tech sector. In that case, Your Honor, uh, objection hearsay. All right. And did you wish to be heard? Is there any exception? It is a hearsay ex uh, hearsay objection. Uh, no. Okay. Then the uh, motion to strike is granted, and the court sustains that objection. Uh, have you seen, have it, had the chance to see Toby Clark much since law school? No, not in these recent years, but we used to meet up. At least once. And do you know if it's the same person he was in law school? I believe so. I still keep up with him on social media, and I know he still takes up pro bono cases. I believe he represented a child's family for free last year. Uh, objection, Your Honor, as to specific instances of conduct under character. Sustained. Motion to strike. <laughs> that is granted. Thank you. Uh, no further questions, Your Honor. All right, cross examination. Good afternoon, Ms. Yang. Good afternoon. You're here testifying on behalf of the defendant? Yes, I am. You think very highly of the defendant? Of course, he's my friend. But you knew the defendant back in law school? That's true. We were classmates. You haven't lived with the defendant since? No, not at all. You haven't worked with the defendant since? No. You don't know Kieran Sunshine? No, I don't know Kieran Sunshine personally. Or anything about the product of Foreverflex? No, not personally. 
You haven't actually seen the defendant in person in years. Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. I have no further questions. All right. Any redirect? Uh, no, Your Honor. May this witness be excused? And by the people as well? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Thank you so much. You are excused. And is there any further evidence from the defense at this time? Uh, no, Your Honor. The defense rests. All right. The defense rests. And at this time, I believe under the rules, there would be closing arguments rather than any rebuttal evidence. Are the people prepared to give their closing argument at this time? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Although prior to proceeding, we'd request a time check for closing arguments on behalf of both parties. All right. Your Honor, for closing arguments, the prosecution has five minutes and 44 seconds remaining while the defense has six minutes and six seconds remaining for closing arguments. Thank you. And you may proceed. May it please the court. It's July 16th, and Kieran Sunshine tells the defendant he's going to come clean about the problems with Foreverflex. This, Your Honor, presents a serious problem for the defendant. Now, it's stipulated that the information contained in the Foreverflex patent application is false. That negligence alone could mean that the defendant loses his job. But if it came to light that he knew about the problems with Foreverflex and deliberately lied on the patent application anyway, well, that's fraud. And the defendant could lose his job, his law license, and even his freedom. That was a risk he could not take. So he killed Kieran Sunshine to keep him quiet. And for that reason, the people have charged the defendant with a violation of California Penal Code, Section 189, first degree murder. To meet our burden, we had to prove that the defendant killed Kieran Sunshine with intent, premeditation, and deliberation. We have met our burden. Now, first, we know the defendant knew about the problems with Foreverflex. You heard from multiple witnesses about the meeting on January 3rd in which Kieran Sunshine ran into the defendant's office, closed the door, closed the blinds, and when he emerged an hour later, his relationship with the defendant had fractured. According to the defendant, all Kieran had said was that the Foreverflex results were amazing. That's not reasonable. But until now, Kieran Sunshine was the only person who knew the defendant knew about the Foreverflex test results the only person who could implicate the defendant in fraud and end his career. On July 16th, Kieran Sunshine told the defendant that was exactly what he was going to do. We've proven intent. Now, the defense also tried to call into question specific pieces of physical evidence. Your Honor, we agree that in isolation, one of these pieces of evidence wouldn't conclusively link the defendant to the crime scene, but it's not the evidence in isolation that matters. It's the totality of the circumstances. So let's look at the totality of the circumstances in today's case. The defense might be able to explain away the defendant's fingerprints on the murder weapon alone. What they claimed was the only evidence that tied him to the murder in today's case. But in the context of fibers from the defendant's silk scarf found on Kieran Sunshine's dead body, geofence data placing Kieran Sunshine, excuse me, the defendant near the scene of the crime at the time of the murder, and eyewitness testimony from both Jerry Moyad and Amari Sunshine placing the defendant at the scene of the murder, as well as testimony of a history of tension between the decedent and the defendant leading up to July 16th, Your Honor, there is no room left for reasonable doubt. There is simply no reasonable explanation for all of that evidence than the defendant. But if there is any doubt left in the court's mind, we need only look to the defendant's actions after the murder. The defendant had been preparing for this board meeting for months. She ex he expedited a patent application simply to be able to present it at that board meeting. And yet on the morning of July 17th, he left at 5 a.m. with his phone off without telling a single person. 
Your Honor, how could the defendant leave to skip a board meeting he was supposed to present at? unless somehow he knew there wasn't going to be a board meeting at all that day. The defendant tried to tell you, I just couldn't stand to watch Kieran lie at the board meeting. But he also admitted that once he found out the, defend the decedent planned to lie, he continued setting up for that board meeting, taking marketing calls and setting up the meeting space. He only decided to leave the night of July 16th, after killing Kieran Sunshine. Today, we've made it absolutely clear that if Kieran Sunshine came clean to the board about the problems with Forever Flex, the defendant who had committed fraud for the sake of that patent application would have lost everything. And that was a risk he could not take. For these reasons, we ask that you find the defendant guilty of first degree murder. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. And defense? Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, there is simply no direct evidence against my client, and the prosecution has not proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Toby Clark committed this crime. First, let's look at the physical evidence. Now, Clark's fingerprints on the saber might be suspicious if it weren't for the fact that Clark had given the saber to Kieran as a gift. For the bread and blue silk fibers, again, those could be troubling if it weren't for the fact that Kieran is the one who gave the scarf to Clark. For the bloody shoe print, well, Jerry and Amari owned the exact same type of shoe, and they all wore sizes that matched the print. Plus, none of the shoes were ever found anyway. And the geofence data simply cannot be relied upon either due to its margin of error. Your Honor, none of the prosecution's physical evidence implicates my client, and their witnesses are not much better. The prosecution's key witness, Jerry Moyad, is a known fraud and liar who was biased against Toby Clark to begin with due to the fact that Clark mocked her profession every chance he got. Now, is this individual a reliable source of information? Of course not, and yet the prosecution practically builds their case on her testimony. A testimony where she supposedly hears an argument around 11 p.m. between Kieran and who she thinks might be Toby, but didn't hear anything else besides the arguing, and was so concerned with what she heard that she took her shower and went to bed. Now let's take a look at the prosecution's other witness, Amari Sunshine, who claims that she saw Toby rounding the corner at the end of the hallway. But Amari's room is roughly 200 feet away from where this person would have been, two-thirds of a football field. There is absolutely no way Amari could have seen who this was, and yet she offered Clark's name to the detective anyway. In fact, while she was a person of interest, Amari offered a lot of information about Clark to the detective. And if her claim about seeing Clark at the end of the hallway can be invalidated by simple measurements, then what else was Amari making up? Or more importantly, why? Why was Amari so eager to get the detective's attention off of herself? Now, we know that growing up, Amari and Kieran had a tense rivalry, constantly competing with one another. But when their dad chose Kieran to become the CEO instead of Amari, this rivalry from Amari's perspective turned into hatred. It wasn't supposed to be that way. Amari was the eldest child, and she was stepped over by her own father, cast aside as Kieran took what should have been hers. Amari became consumed by a jealousy and a bitterness that only grew more and more painful as time went on. And then, on the eve of what seemed to be Kieran's greatest achievement, Amari simply couldn't take it anymore. Amari Sunshine would murder her brother that night, go on to inherit his shares, take a long-desired place as CEO and majority shareholder, and continue on her dad's legacy the way she thought it was meant to be continued. It all went according to plan. Now, we've established a motive for what Amari did, but what about opportunity? Well, Amari had a room in the same hotel as Kieran on the same floor. Amari, would have met, Amari met Kieran in Kieran's room and would have seen the saber sitting on the fireplace. On the night of the murder, nobody's able to say where Amari was besides Amari. And we know from the prosecution's own expert witness that the time of death was between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m., a four-hour window in which Kieran could have been killed. Clearly, Amari had ample opportunity to commit this crime. And looking at the physical evidence, Amari's shoe, uh, shoe size and shoe type matches the print found at the scene. We know that Amari's right-handed, and we know that there are fingerprints on the saber completely unaccounted for. 
We also know from the prosecution's own witness, Jerry Moyad, that there was a blue latex glove found in the hallway, one which the killer could have used to conceal the fingerprints altogether. And unlike Toby, uh, unlike uh, Toby Clark, Amari doesn't have a rotator cuff injury that prevents her from committing the stabbing altogether. Your Honor, regardless if there's enough evidence to convict Amari Sunshine, there is certainly enough to point towards Amari as a reasonable alternative to the defendant. And when there's a reasonable alternative, there's reasonable doubt. And when there's reasonable doubt, the defendant must be acquitted. Now, to call this investigation botched would be an understatement. The detective in this case knew everything I just told you about Amari and largely had Amari yes. as a person of interest. But, but when the uh, detective met with Amari Sunshine, Amari was able to skew the detective's attention away from herself and onto Clark. Or maybe the detective had paid more attention to Amari Sunshine instead of letting her slip away, things would have turned out differently. But unfortunately, that's not what happened here. Your Honor, the prosecution has haphazardly pieced together this chase, trying to project the image of a sound argument. Because if you pull back the curtain, you'll find that there is simply nothing there. Lack of physical evidence, a motive that is based on unreliable witness testimony, and an opportunity that is shared by multiple other people. But they're still forced to build their case on this unstable foundation precisely because they have nothing else of substance to offer the court. They're grasping at straws, Your Honor. They've come up empty-handed. We humbly request that you find the defendant not guilty. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Blitch. And uh, are you ready to proceed with a final argument? Yes, Your Honor. All right, go ahead. Let's talk about the defense's alternate suspect. Unlike the defendant, Imari Sunshine's fingerprints were not found on the murder weapon. Unlike the defendant, fibers from her scarf were not, not found on Kieran Sunshine's dead body. Unlike the defendant, Amari Sunshine's phone did not ping within the geofence surrounding Kieran Sunshine's suite at the time of his death. Unlike the defendant, Amari Sunshine was not seen and heard by two separate eyewitnesses the night of the murder. And Amari Sunshine is not reasonable doubt. And unlike the defendant, maybe Amari Sunshine got the CEO position but at the cost of losing her little brother. Whereas Toby Clark stood to lose everything if Kieran Sunshine came clean. That was a risk he couldn't take. So we ask that you find the defendant guilty. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trump and Mr. Blitch. Uh, Your Honor, the prosecution just spent most of the rebuttal talking about physical evidence that is easily refuted and witness testimony that is unreliable. And they're forced to talk about those things precisely because they have nothing else. They're grasping at straws. They are throwing spaghetti at the wall, but none of it has stuck. Mari Sunshine is still a reasonable alternative. There is still reasonable doubt, and the defendant must be acquitted. Thank you. Thank you both. And uh, at this time, does either team wish to consult with their coaches? There are no irregularities from the people, Your Honor. All right. And from the defense? No irregularities, Your Honor. All right. Very well. I want to thank uh, both counsel and both teams for their advocacy as well as their civility towards one another in this very important case. Um, the people have the burden of proving the charge beyond a reasonable doubt. It is a high burden, and the defense has uh, proposed some um, things for the court to think about. Uh, however, the people have met those arguments head on in the presentation of the evidence as well as in their arguments. And so the court does find at this time that uh, the defendant is guilty and the people have met their burden of proof of beyond a reasonable doubt. And at this time, uh, I think uh, everybody wants to applaud these professional level attorneys. So. I've done this for a number of years. I started out as an attorney uh, back, I think, in 1996 or 1997 with this program. And uh, 
No, <laughs> thank you. And uh, for the past 10 years, I've had the honor of uh, being a presider. And every year, I think somebody mentioned, every year the bar gets higher. And I am just so impressed uh, with those of you that I thought had raised the bar last year or the year before, but you just keep um, topping yourselves. And you also are uh, giving your newer teammates the gift of your enthusiasm. And I can sense that you are all real teammates encouraging one another. And that really is part of the culture that we have amongst the legal community here in Monterey County that I think is very special. And I mentioned the civility that you all have. That's something that's very important for uh, everybody who practices law here. We may have some disagreements about rulings or the law or how cases should be resolved. Um, and so those things are all worked out in court under the rules of court. And when everybody leaves, uh, they recognize that each uh, person is a professional and an individual that has a life and a family and humanity. And all of that is so important because the purpose of having our legal system is so that we can come into a courtroom and have people advocate and do so to resolve uh, problems and questions and disputes that people have without resulting in violence. So it, it is a tremendous calling, and I hope that some of you uh, choose to follow it through, but regardless of what you decide to do, you're very well poised to do it in the future. It's also wonderful to see a lot of new faces every year, and it's also nice to see some returning faces. There are a number of folks in this courtroom whose kids are here, and actually, um, Scarlett's a grandfather was the person who gave me my first job offer in the district attorney's office. And then I had the honor of uh, working with her mother. Uh, well, when I say working with, I suppose that's, that's a term of art because we were on opposite sides of the table. Um, she's an, a phenomenal attorney, especially with regard to juvenile cases. And so it's great to see Scarlett participating. But I know that there's a lot of folks in here who perhaps uh, like me, uh, never had met an attorney before or had any experience with a family member. I don't think I, I met an attorney before I went to law school. Uh, but this is a profession that is open to everyone. So um, I wanted to also commend the attorneys for their use of the rules. Um, as well as really not only knowing, uh, like all the witnesses, uh, the statements, but also um, knowing all of the stipulations and really knowing your rules of evidence and using those rules of evidence to your advantage. You, um, both sides made great objections and you were uh, prepared for the responses on the other side and uh, you were able to do quite a bit of back and forth. And that too is what we do in court in terms of, you know, is it really uh, impeachment or is it character evidence? And uh, you all did a great job.